Yeah, okay. it's good. All good. A deal's good. Dr. I keep it simple. Slap. I keep it simple. Yeah. Wrath of Khan. Wrath of Khan. Wrath of Khan. There you go. Wrath of Khan. Yeah. What is going on here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we did get you something. Very confused. Oh, small, small gift. A small gift. Yeah, you probably should have like done this before he came here. Looks like it it'll fit easily. Prepped it, you know. Scored it in there. First <laughs> <laughs> what are we doing here? Oh shit! What <laughs> is going on here? Oh, get the <laughs> fuck out of here! Oh. <laughs> no shit. Where'd you guys come across this? Get the fuck out of here. Yeah. How'd you score that? Holy shit. Yeah, that's yours, man. That's unreal. Jesus Christ. It actually has LED lights that light up behind it and it illuminates it. Like that. Those it's are both the rookie cars that go in there. They're all PSA 10s. Holy shit. Cool, man. huh? Fuck. Thank you so much, yeah. man. Dude, that's amazing. That's ridiculous. Only problem is you don't live anywhere for longer than two <laughs> yeah. days. I don't know yeah. if we're going to put so this. Where are you going to hang it, dude? Put it, you put it in storage. Shit. This is wild. Is that what you were texting me the other day about this? It was. Oh, real yeah. Jeez, you had me. That's <laughs> <laughs> this was Dude, that's unreal. You got so I met this guy like uh, about three years ago or so. And I, I don't think anybody does it as good as he does. So this if you'll see tonight we'll go to my house, I have my my room done and all basketball stuff that he does. Dude, this is wild. I met him after I got this. Like, like now this is like a piece of shit. <laughs> yeah. You'll see my house <laughs> is full of these right here. Yeah, it's it's cold. Cold. Work either way, does. It. I've never seen anybody does anything close to it. Nuts, man. Yeah, it's all of them will have like sick two, you know, rookie cards in there and everything. So things. Holy shit! <laughs> Fuck, thanks, fellas. Whoa, this was a good one. We had two doctors on. Doctor Jordan Shallow. You might know him on Instagram as the Muscle Doc. He's the really buffed power lifter who's also super, super smart. And Dr. Adil Khan, you might not know him, but he is one of the leading researchers and doctors with futuristic medicine. I mean, stuff you're gonna see, he's doing now, you're gonna see being done in 10 years. In fact, in today's episode, we talk about, of course, strength training, of course, training methodologies, but then we get into like some incredible advancements and how you can treat yourself for chronic diseases, peptide therapy, stem cell therapy, platelet-rich plasma. But really, uh, what Dr. Adil Khan is doing, um, nobody else is doing right now. So he's a he's an expert in muscle, musculoskeletal medicine, pain medicine, and regenerative medicine. In fact, today's episode was a lot about how to regenerate the body, how to improve longevity, how to reduce your biological age basically make yourself feel more vibrant and healthy. And of course, Dr. Jordan Shallow, one of our favorite strength training experts, he's also the creator of the Prescript um, certification, which is uh, exceptional. So you can find Dr. Jordan Shallow at The Muscle Doc, and you can find Dr. Adil Khan at Dr. Akhan. Akhan is A-K-H-A-N. Today's program giveaway is a super bundle. That's a lot of MAPS programs. Here's how you can win it. Leave a comment below this video in the first 24 hours that we drop it. Subscribe to this channel and turn on notifications. If you win, we'll let you know in the comments section. We also have a sale going on this month. Maps Bands, half off. The Hard Gainer Bundle of Programs, half off. You can find them both by clicking on the link at the top of the description below. All right, here we are interviewing Dr. Jordan Shallow and Dr. Adil Khan. Jordan, always, always a blast having you on the show. Been too long. Been, been too long. And you brought someone with you, Adil, Dr. Khan. I'm uh, his assistant. Yeah. Okay. I just hold his bag. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> he can hold his own bag. <laughs> Most qualified assistant I've ever yeah, had. So, uh, so first off, Jordan, how you been? Good, man. Yeah, it's nice to be back. Bay Area, always uh, nostalgic to be in the Bay, especially in here. But yeah, life's crazy. That's awesome. Yeah, so, you, you guys are like my canary on the coal mine. Though. Like, you, when I, if ever I think I'm busy, I come talk to you guys. I'm like, I got another gear there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> you look great, man. You don't stay in one place for longer than like 10 days. No. Yeah. All over the place. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a wild, like, couple of years, man. Been on the road, lived on the road consistently for, I mean, it's been coming on like five years. Yeah. Five years rocking up the air miles. So, yeah. Do you foresee yourself slowing down anytime soon and, and calling a place? Uh, it's tough, man. Like, you know, there's kind of two ends. And, you know, one side, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about today on the concierge medicine side, which kind of keeps me running. But, you know, we also have like, Prescript on the education side, which, as you guys probably know, benefits from being in one place more often. So it's kind of balancing like 
you know, I have, I'm in the position owning an education company, which is crazy. Cause like I hated school, but like, <laughs> I, I think there's always uh, there's value in skin in the game, right? Like the stuff we teach are the principles that I use when I work with pro athletes, but I have to work with pro athletes. Like espousing this, you know, this information from someone's basement is less valuable because it's, it doesn't show that there's inherent risk. There's a lot of like academic chicken hawks that are sending people out in the world with information that hasn't, that they're not abiding by and they're mm -hmm. not accepting the risks and consequences of what they're teaching, right? Mm -hmm. At the, at, at the level of the end user. So like for me, it's a fine balance as like a founder and a business owner and in the education space to have tried and battle tested the stuff that I, the principles that I'm teaching at the highest level with the highest stakes. So it's like, it's, it is a tough balance with like a digital business that is based off of, you know, it's based off experience, based off credentials, it's based off of trust in the education space and gaining that trust by, you know, being out in the world and, and working with athletes all over. And then also being able to fall back and be consistently on meetings and, and mm -hmm. being like an active part of the business and developing and growing the business. So it's been really hard, like finding that fine balance. And like, I have a really good team that helps take care of the stuff in a more static nature, the stuff that has to be done week in, week out while I'm on the road. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult thing to balance because they're in complete opposition with one yeah. another. Well, and it's a lot of work for sure, but it's what also makes you so valuable because um, there's, there's you know, uh, data, there's information that you can pull from studies um, and test groups. And then there's applying it in the real world and working with people. And when you combine that experience with data, that's where you get the best information. And it, so it just, it's a lot of work, but very few people can do it like you can. So we appreciate, by the way, a lot of incredible comments from your from people taking your courses, always mm -hmm. saying it's one of the best courses that they've done um, in the space. So great yeah. job. I appreciate it, man. Yeah. It's, it's not an easy space. No, no, it's, it's competitive. And yeah, you know, even that poses a challenge is like, we'll, we'll run a 16 to 20 week semester and I'll be in 20 different locations. Like I've taught a lecture. I was talking to my, my partner about this the other day. I taught a lecture at every hour of the day, given the time zone. So I've taught at three in the morning in London <laughs> oh taught my God. at, uh, you know, uh, 5 30 AM. Well, I've taught, taught at 5 AM this morning. But as I travel around, I still keep up with teaching the live lectures, right? Because, you know, these things update and we have to talk about current trends. Wow. And we have to talk about, uh, you know, new emerging research. And we have to talk about how this fits into like a biomechanical model that already exists. Like there's immutable principles that we teach that allows people to start to take in and synthesize new and emerging trends in the industry. So, you know, I've committed to not making it an evergreen course and making it something that I teach on the fly. And I, I think for as long as I own the company, we'll, we'll always do that. But like... I've taught from a cave in Turkey. I've taught from a, <laughs> uh, a Panda Express. I got held. <laughs> I got held up in what? Sunny Isles, Florida, while teaching a lecture. Some guy was sticking me up for cash. What? No. They way. called it the Mick lectures. The people. It's our level two <laughs> courses. Lecture. Our more advanced uh, anatomy <laughs> biomechanics course. And I'm literally getting like shaken down for cash. No. While way. I'm sitting in a McDonald's in Sunny Isles, everyone's like. Like, is he getting robbed right now? Like, <laughs> yeah. oh, what the fuck is happening? What? Why you yeah. were live recording? Oh, I was live recording. No yeah, dude. way. Oh, we got to see what? that. Yeah. yeah. This guy's like, I'm like, yo, dog, like, I don't have it. I can literally got my hands in the air. And I'm like, yeah, so the rib cage. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> it was wild. I mean, I've taught for- Bro, a I can't believe yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, oh, Will wow. Ahmed's office and Whoop headquarters. I did a podcast with Will. And I'm like, hey, I know you're the CEO of this like billion dollar company and all, but I really got to use your office. <laughs> Oh, and so he's like, yeah, sure. So I'm like in Will's chair, like in his office overlooking oh, like downtown Boston. God. Yeah, it's been fun. But yeah, there's there's an accountability that I that I keep to myself. Like, look, we got to keep this current. We got to keep it relevant. And the only way I can show that is like, and I tell people, look, you know, sometimes the quality is not, you know, we have a studio and, and, and back in Toronto and we'll film in there when we can. But I tell people at the jump, like, Sometimes it's going to be laptops. Sometimes I'm going to have like some guy shaking me down, but <laughs> I do that to keep myself accountable to the things that I'm teaching. Bro, please tell me you're, you're journaling this or yeah. logging it because there's a book here, dude. After oh, this. yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's 100 the, I mean, I've written a few. I've written three of our textbooks already, but the one I want to write is like, if, if there's a potential exit in our future, yeah. Yes. I remember being in Australia three in the morning. I got trapped there during COVID. And so the lecture times did not work out at all. So two, three times a week, I was up at two, three in the morning. And a fucking cockroach, dude, like like an Australian sized cockroach <laughs> ran across the camera. <laughs> so you just see this like no men in way. black type <laughs> alien. And dude, for the I was I had my headphones <laughs> on with microphone and I literally sat on like the, the I fucking hate. I'm better now. I sat on like the the kitchen island. 10 feet away. They could barely even see me. And I was like, so the next slide, 
if you were to see it because I'm not going to my fucking computer and I just left. <laughs> yeah, dude, it was, it's been it's been wild. That's great, That's bro. Great. Oh, so you got to put together like a reel of like all these, yeah, yeah, we keep all the lectures dedicated. Yeah, yeah, dedicated. yeah, yeah it's yeah. not. So dude. tell us about uh, who you're bringing with us, and I love yeah. to hear from, from Sp- the so special guests. I mean, especially like I talked about on the concierge medical side of things, there's no one who does it better in a collaborative fashion than, than Doctor Adil Khan. So Adil and I have been colleagues for what like three, four, five years now. Um, we got connected just through the sports world. He's like a hard guy to get after. Like those in the know know a deal and what he does in the regenerative regenerative medicine space, branching into uh, longevity in, in a pretty aggressive fashion. So yeah, I mean, a deal, you probably do a better elevator pitch. I usually... That's the nicest thing I've ever said about you. That's true. <laughs> so um, I'll stop before I'm it takes a turn. Like, I was just letting you finish. I'm like, I'm blushing right now. So no, but what he said is so important. It's basically like not just being in the basement, but being a practitioner of what you're actually doing. And that big problem with the longevity and anti-aging space, because it's becoming such a hot topic. There's all these guys who are just scientists and lab like lab geeks essentially, but they're not actually doing real application. So I'm a clinician scientist, meaning I'm doing research, but I'm also doing clinical translation mm. where I'm actually helping people and actually applying real world technologies. So initially, like you said, we started out in sports medicine where we're doing regenerative therapies, which are basically just trying to restore repair tissue back to a previous state. Like most people have probably heard of like stem cells by now or yeah. platelet rich plasma, but we just kind of have higher quality and we have different kind of levels of that stuff. So it's not just the same generic things that everyone else has access to. And so that's how we got connected because we worked on some elite athletes and getting them back to playing faster. And how can we craft like a narrative where we can get them without surgery? Because team doctors, most team doctors, like people think, oh, you're, you know, you're like the Miami Heat doctor, so you must be the best. But the reality is they're, they're maybe the best surgeons. Like they're really good at cutting because they're orthopedic surgeons, yeah. that's their job. But they're not necessarily good at actually like injecting or repairing tissue or regenerative medicine, which is like cell therapy that's and different. gene therapy. That's a different specialty. And mm-hmm. you have to know that stuff inside and out. And like that's being a specialist in that field. And that's what I am. So that's what I focus on, cell and gene therapy. And then we're also doing some tissue engineering work. But the three of those together is really what the field of regenerative medicine is. How did you get into that? Uh, like, how did you, because people are like, okay, I want to work with like high level elite athletes and whatever. And like, how did you get into that? It was, uh, I mean, I guess it was Dr. Tony Gallia. He was kind of like the pioneer of platelet-rich plasma. He was the guy who actually pioneered that technology. Like PRP is old now, but like 20 years ago, he was the only one doing it. And he was the first one who started it for musculoskeletal conditions. So he treated like Tiger Woods, like Mike Tyson, like a lot of bi- Alex Rodriguez, like a lot of big names. And it was because he was the guy doing PRP who started it all. So he was basically, his claim to fame was like, I can get people back faster with injuries without having to do surgery or even just back faster. W- if they have like a tear, he can get them back playing in a couple of weeks. And people are like, how's he doing that? And it was, it was just this whole idea that we can use your own body's kind of plasma to heal itself faster. But now the technology has evolved with stem cells and now with gene editing and gene therapy. And there's so much more that we can do that he like back then that was the only option. So he's still just doing PRP, which is great, Mm -hmm. but he's also in his 60s. So so I kind of the guy now innovating and kind of bringing the next tier of technology to the masses. Mm -hmm. And then you guys met because you guys worked on the same athletes. Yeah. Collaborating with athletes like, you know, I think a deal is probably one of the best clinicians on like the more conventional medical side of things, like slightly more invasive at understanding scope and n- knowing when something is a functional issue over a structural issue. Right. And I think that's, that's where like the partnership works really well when we co-manage pro athletes is like, I know when to draw the line and be like, look, this is a structural issue that can't be outfunctioned, Right. And the line might be, you know, case by case basis, blurred a little bit towards him or a little bit towards me. Right. But I know when, cause people look at an injury and they, you know, there's two things, there's injury and tissue damage. And most people think of that Venn diagram as a circle, right? Where we can, we can operate pain free in the presence of tissue damage. And sometimes we can't, sometimes we can't. Right. So knowing how to dissociate how much of the pain that's slowing them down is as a byproduct or is a byproduct of tissue damage is like a key differentiation to make. And if the tissue damage is so that I look, I can't do anything with it. Right. An ankle, a disc, a shoulder labrum, a cervical <laughs> spine issue, knowing where the limits of like my scope are and knowing when to dish the rock to him and vice versa. All right. Let's let me yeah. add. So, so Jordan, you're one of the best at, uh, I, I guess I would loosely call correctional exercise. You're exceptional at what you do. You're also extremely honest, maybe to a fault. So, so what, how big of an impact does what, what, uh, Dr. Adil Khan does on getting someone to move better and faster? Cause you apply your correctional exercise, which, 
you know, we're somewhat versed in, we've been worked, we've worked with specialists in the past. We've worked with clients. It's exceptional. It's, it's amazing. There's no, you don't have to use any medicines or surgeries. Correctional exercise applies to a lot of uh, situations, but then those, those situations where I got to get there faster. You're a pro athlete. Yeah, so yeah, correctional athlete. exercise, but I got to play in a week or correctional exercise isn't going to work because like you said, there's a tear or there's a heel, there's something that needs to heal that this isn't going to necessarily fix. How big of a difference does what he does do to somebody when you combine forces? Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's non, it's nonlinear, right? It's exponential. Like it's a logarithmic relationship. So like, if you look at scaling the rehabilitation, it's, it's not like it expedites across a linear curve. It's literally an inflection point on a hockey stick, right? Because you can make the classic, you know, non-invasive treatment for a lot of these things still, unfortunately, in a lot of cases is like a glucocorticoid, right? right? A, a cortisone, right? Which is degenerative and catabolic. It's cardiotoxic, right. which means it actually eats away at the cartilage. Yeah. So it mm. literally is like kill the inflammation signal. Oh, I feel better. But now the signaling for healing is gone right. too. But classically in kind of my world, those things were depending on the severity of tissue damage, kind of a silver bullet. Because if it could give you, accept the risk that comes with it, it gives you a window to start to hopefully fully improve function because you can then move the way that you need to to get new exactly. movement patterns mm -hmm. and so on. exactly okay. so it's that but rather than having the catabolic degenerative factors it has anabolic growth factors right so now it's like you're getting the same res the anti-inflammatory you know results of like a cortisone injection but you're getting it by you know a natural means of signaling and you're actually getting tissue to regenerate on the back end so that's where you start to really hit that uptick okay so you have a lot of experience working with athletes obviously before meeting him uh, and working with uh dr deal working with uh, some of the stuff were you shocked at first because you know you know what to expect you've worked with so many people like okay this should get better in this period of time were you like what the hell yeah i mean i had in the regenerative field, I had some personal experience with like peptides and things like that. Nothing to like the level of technology that we're dealing with now. But, you know, in the research, you start to read about the viability and efficacy of some of these things. I think it's it's one of those things where unfortunately it becomes in some respects like practitioner specific, right? Like you do need to, and I've watched them do this, you know, X number of times, you know, at the end of the day, the, the right compound needs to get to the right place, mm. right? These are usually site specific. So like getting to, it's really cool getting to watch him with a diagnostic ultrasound. He usually has like a, a an ultrasound technician with him mm. guiding and these things. Yeah, it's sick. Oh, it, wow, it's it's wow. so like, have you ever pulled Precision a paint chip way, off yeah. a door and you're like, oh, that was satisfying. <laughs> 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 it's like watching on the screen, like just the needle go in. And we, you know, we've done a few now where we'll do multiple rounds for more complex cases. And we'll be able to see, like, and correlate from, like, I can correlate from a performance standpoint, like an increase of endurance or an ability mm -hmm. to tolerate mm -hmm. intensity or, uh, fuck, even in more advanced cases, you start to see it uh, in short amounts of time, a, an increase in velocity at that joint, which is crazy because, like, that's kind of how stimuli scales. It goes endurance, intensity, velocity. As we get into sports, we start to talk more about timing. Like, in the matter of what just recently, and I, and I won't name names in this case, but in the course of, what, two and a half weeks? between uh, Miami and Toronto, you saw a ligament in the wrist cause like more or less completely heal. Like, and like it wait, was, wait, what? so I, when I've, uh, that's like a three month, two month. Uh, well, uh, they told him he needed surgery and they said there's no other option. Yeah. Which and they said not full rupture. And that's the MRI. And that's the problem with diagnostics in general. <laughs> and this was kind of my claim to fame, I guess, so to speak. So I treated a guy named Mohammed Alibar, who's uh, he's hey. a, he's the richest man in Dubai. So he owns the six tallest buildings in the world. And so he, he owns a Burj Khalifa too. And so he had this shoulder issue for like uh, 20 years. And so they did cortisone didn't work. They said, okay, just do physio because there's nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. So he's just a physio. He's literally did physio for 20 years, once a week. And then uh, he, like we, we got connected actually through Jordan. And so I went, so he flew me down and then we did an ultrasound. We found some small tears and then we fixed it with the regenerative stuff. And he was just like blown away. And like his his wife had something similar too and I was able to fix her too. So he was happier wow. that I could fix his wife than he <laughs> by himself. And to, but, to be clear, this is not just pain relief. This is actually No, it's, it's perfect. Yeah. He's good. He's still good. Like, now is this BPC-157? That's the one I'm familiar with. I've used it is that where you, is that what no, you No, we use, typically use exosomes or stem cells or PRP, depending. Mm. And, we mix it with pep, and we mix it with peptides because peptides have a synergistic effect and they mm. target different signaling pathways and work with the exosomes or stem cells to facilitate healing and regeneration. So a lot of times I'll mix BPC-157 and TB4 <gasps> with my regenerative molecules to facilitate the healing and regeneration. What? Oh, wow. And sometimes you'll do it in surgery. What? Wow. Yeah. Wow. How are you getting the stem cells? Uh, so the stem cell manufacturing and 
sourcing is really like an intricate, like there's a lot of details there, but the gist of it is that you have to know how to select the right donors, but you also have to know how to grow the stem cells properly. And that's the biggest problem with a lot of these, like you guys probably heard of Colombia and Panama and like yeah. a lot of yeah. these people going to those places. And the problem is like there's, because there's lack of regulation over there, you don't really, really know what you're getting. Mm -hmm. And like, just because- What Joe, could go wrong? Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah, right. Or just because some celebrities endorsing it, they're promoting it. They're like, you know, they're like, this is the best place ever. It's just, it, to me, that's predatory marketing because you're not actually talking about the science, you're just talking about the results. So to me, I'm always talking about the science. It's like, how do we grow the stem cells? How can we enhance them? What's the culture medium? And there's all these details that we go into to make sure we're having the best quality stem cells. And the way we do that is we test the cell viability, meaning make, we make sure they survive when we actually inject them. And then we actually have a second generation of stem cells. This is really cool technology. So Basically, there was a guy named uh, Professor Yamanaka. He won the Nobel Prize like like eight years ago for uh, genetic reprogramming. So it's, it's pretty crazy, but basically you can take any cell in your body and you can turn it into a naked stem cell. So you could take any muscle cell, any somatic cell in your body, and you can make it basically into an embryonic stem cell state, which is pretty crazy. That's basically telling you your body has this in innate ability to in heal. In all the cells. In all hmm. cells, any cell in the body. And so it's called the Yamanaka factors. And basically, if you overexpress those Yamanaka factors, you can create any embryonic stem cell. Stem cell. But the problem with embryonic stem cells, they're too strong. They can ca cause tumors because they have mm. uncontrolled mm. proliferation. Damn. So this is called induced pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs. And no one, could, no one could figure out like, how do we use iPSCs clinically without causing tumors? Right. But they were good models in for studying different diseases. But in the last few years, what we figured out was we could actually gene edit these iPSCs to prevent uncontrolled proliferations. So they're called gene edited iPSC cells. And then you can have different cell lines from that. So that's the technology that we've licensed out. And we basically have gene edited iPSC derived MSCs, which are mesenchymal stem cells. And basically we can use those for specific issues. So like, so we have cell lines for osteoarthritis. We have cell lines for neurodegenerative conditions. We have cell lines for like diabetes. Uh, so you can have specific cell lines for specific let's, conditions. Let's back up for a second because yeah. people, our audience, some people might be like, all right, what's going on here? Okay, so <laughs> stem cells, when you start with a basic, a essentially a blueprint, right? A Blank slate stem cell. That means it can turn it into essentially any other cell. So if you need regenerative cells for let's say this the for let's say myelin sheaths right let's say you're dealing with MS or you you mentioned arthritis to help rebuild and build back bone or joint done properly apparently these stem cells can then turn into the cells that are needed to regenerate that's that's essentially yes. in a nutshell right exactly but the, the problem is with the gen 1 let's call it umbilical cord stem cells which is what mm -hmm. most people are still using we still use them too but the problem with gen 1 is they don't stay in there very long they're just they get taken up by your immune system and they're cleared up so they're mainly just doing what's called pericrine signaling mm -hmm. so they're sending signals that help to regenerate a little bit of tissue but they're mainly just anti-inflammatory got it so if you really want to regenerate tissue it needs a constant flow of blood supply and it needs to be protected from the immune system. So the way we do that is we use 3D bioprinted hydrogels. So these hydro the stem cells are embedded into the hydrogels, and then you can inject them, or you can put them in arthroscopically, and then you can actually regrow and your tissue. And they stick there. And they I, stay I, there. I, okay, why wow. is this not on the cover of every magazine, yeah, no, every right. news exactly. outlet? Because exactly. this is like We're just one of the most negative. massive I know. disruptors. Dude, and I was reading a paper just two weeks ago. Like there was, in, I mean, just like cerebral palsy, which is like a devastating condition for like, yeah. you know, IV stem cells help this. There's a, it's published. It literally made the girl walk again. Like wow. ima imagine if that was a pharmaceutical, it would be on every headline. Yes. Right, and so that's that's the problem. With is this. that why? Because we can't fucking patent it in one company. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. Exactly. Ah. That's that's what it comes down to, and that's the same problem with peptides, right? You guys know peptides yeah, probably yeah. better than most people. Why are peptides still illegal or like not allowed, right? Because they're not patentable, yeah. and so because a compound can, pharmacy can make them for you. Yeah, yeah, but but if you go to your average doctor, they don't even know what peptides are, yeah. and or they'll say that shit is dangerous. Don't don't do it. Like don't get it. Don't yeah. don't use this that. This is even crazy. <laughs> well, I mean, you just you just talked yeah. about something though that's interesting because uh, I was I'm. For, I'm somewhat loosely familiar with how stem cells were used before. And you mentioned something, which was the fear that people would always talk about, right? Which is, yeah, they definitely can do this, but then they grow out of control and can become tumors. You're saying that the ones now that are genetically altered or modified don't do Is that. Is there a risk of that with that? And plus with wow. mesenchymal stem cells or stromal cells, which is the more appropriate term, but everyone calls them stem cells, but uh, MSCs, that's the ones that's derived from like umbilical cord tissue or fat or bone marrow. You can get them from a lot of different sources, but umbilical cord tissue has the best cytokine profile. So like mm -hmm. the most growth factors and most anti-inflammatory signaling molecules. So that's the one that we typically use. But like we were saying, the problem is that they're not, because they are still allogeneic, meaning they're not from your own body, they still do have a little bit of an immune response. Right. And so they're not going to stick around forever. So even when you do intravenous stem cells, we do them for anti-aging, for like autoimmunity, for lots of different 
conditions, they only stay in your system for maybe four weeks. So how do they work so well? It's because of the signaling and immunomodulatory benefits. That's what they're doing. So that's what they're doing. So a lot of people are like, oh, I'm doing stem. And a lot of doctors will say that too. They'll be like, they promise you the world, right? And they're, and that's where like, I, that's why this, this field is full of a lot of snake oil salesmen. And there's a mm -hmm. lot of them around the world because of stem cell, there's so much medical tourism going on. Mm -hmm. so, but I, I was lucky because I worked in Dubai for like four months where this winter, and then basically over there, they've been doing stem cells, like expanded and culture stem cells for over nine years. They're like, approved, they're legal. Mm -hmm. But in, in the US, culture expanded stem cells are still illegal. So when you when you see stem cell clinics in the US, it's basically where they're harvesting your bone marrow your or own. your fat. Yeah. And those aren't stem cells. Those are actually called committed progenitor cells, which are basically just cells that help with reducing inflammation. They don't actually have that stemness to them. Why are they still illegal? Why is it illegal? Yeah, is it, yeah I was going to say, is that the only legal way to harvest? <laughs> to, uh, FDA, 70% of their funding comes from pharmaceutical companies. Like they don't want okay. this stuff to necessarily take off, right? I think it's, it's lobbyists that push against this stuff, unfortunately. And so there are lobbyists who don't want this stuff to become mainstream. And that's why this stuff, the podcast and getting this information out there is so important because it can help a lot of people. And it, it does help a lot people and they can change a lot of lives and like even when I, I worked in Japan this year too and in Japan same thing they have a regulatory framework uh, for regenerative medicine and they've been doing this for since 2014 like culture expanded stem cells. Mm. They're legal. You can do IV stem cells, like no issues for anti-aging, for longevity and all this other stuff. And like over here, you do IV stem cells, the FDA will shut you down right away. Yeah. You know who mm. loves regulations? Big business that's already in business because it yeah. keeps the competitors out of the market. A lot of yeah. people don't understand that. You talk about the hydrogels that protect these cells from your immune system. Yeah. Okay, explain that. So are they, they're encased in this hydrogel? Exactly, they're, the stem cells are embedded into them. So they're not able to send, your, your body's not able to identify them as a potential form. Exactly, okay. exactly. It protects them from the immune system. So this is being done already. We, we've we just licensed out some tech from a European, a Portugal, Portuguese company that already has this technology for injectable hydrogels that the stem cells are embedded into. Uh, and then we're also working with a company called Tissue Labs in Switzerland, and we're making our own embedded stem cell scaffolds for regenerating cartilage. Wow. So we have an orthopedic surgeon that we're working Oh, with. they apply it. Like uh, we, uh, well, yes, exactly. So you, you have like two ports. It's a proprietary 3D bioprinter. And one port has prints the stem cells. And one print one port prints the scaffolding. And they come in together into this like 3D bioprinter. you lay it on the joint or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Grows. And then you put it arthroscopically. Wow. And it resurfaces it. It can resurface the entire The place. hydrogel, is that a lipid base? What, what is it's, that? Uh, it's basically like hyaluronic acid, which is like collagen. Sure. Yeah, but there's different types of hydrogels. And so uh, the best and the safest seems to be just a hyaluronic acid derivative. Because it's biocompatible. Exactly. Wow. Is there, yeah. is is there any applications for this science to to help like with autoimmune issues, reversing that? Or? Yeah, and that's and that's that's the thing, right? Like you can put like it's out there. Like you can put people into remission, like I, with rheumatoid arthritis, wow. inflammatory bowel disease. Like it's crazy. And I've put patients into remission with this stuff. We have a protocol. We use peptides. We use intravenous stem cells, uh, and then we actually are manufacturing our own poop pills, uh, fecal microbial transplant <laughs> (FMT) because FMT can repopulate your gut, and right. that's a huge part of your immune system. That so that's off. our kind of autoimmune protocol that we do for patients to keep them in remission. Yeah, and now are you able to practice that in the States or do you have no, to No, it's all off? off, sure. Wow. Yeah. So yeah. if I wanted to get treatment from you. Los Cabos, Mexico. It's nice. Oh. Mexico? <laughs> wow. Not a bad place. Yeah. Okay, so you, you brought some <laughs> uh, tourism. I gotta, I gotta ask you about this because you brought, and I had to stop talking because I was asking too many questions. I was too excited. We were talking about peptides. You said there's a new technology. You said it was okay. I could bring it up because now this blows me away. So the, the, I don't know, the challenge with peptides, I would say, from the average consumer is I got to inject this every day. Very short half-life, exactly. right? So you yeah. inject yourself with, you know, and it's a small, you know, sub-Q needle, no big deal, but a lot of people still don't like it. I got to inject my MOTC in the morning, or I got to inject my, you know, my CJC or whatever. And you have to do that repeatedly daily because it's got such a short half-life. You guys have a technology where you inject it once and then it tells your body to produce this. Okay, so explain this to me. Yeah. What this is and how so it works. It's the world's first reversible plasmid gene therapy. So let me explain the context and the history about gene therapy so you, okay. everyone can understand it a little bit. But basically, gene therapy has been around since the 90s, but it was or, always viral vectors. And the problem with viral vectors, they're expensive to manufacture, and there also been risks with them and actually some deaths with them too. Um, there was a death in like the late 90s that happened where like it was for like a rare genetic condition, they use a viral vector and unfortunately it caused an infection and then he went to like septic shock and he died. Uh, but so that set the field back of gene therapy research like 10 years because mm -hmm. obviously people, everyone gets scared, right? And right. so th it picked up again in the late 2000s and there's a lot of like what's called adeno associated virus, AAV vector. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of been the mainstay of viral, of how to transfect and how to do gene therapy. But again, it's very expensive to manufacture those and you can't really scale it. So there is one company that's doing them in 
offshore too with AAV vectors, but there's risk with them and they're and, and it costs over a hundred thousand dollars for like these anti-aging gene therapies. Got it. So our plasmid gene therapy, essentially it's a bacterial origin, but there's no live bacteria in there. It's just a circular strand of DNA. Hence the name of our company, Mini Circle, because mm. it's literally just a mini circle. And that mini circle, we can transfect any peptide or protein in the body to tell your body to make more of that. So we can do that one injection subcutaneously, takes two minutes, and it lasts for one and a half to two years. And so then, wow. what, okay, so essentially it's, it's, it's giving, you know, this is a bacterial transporter. Plasma. Not, plasma, it's not active, <laughs> yeah. right? And it tells your cells, hey, keep making this, whatever we put in there. So if you want this peptide to keep, if instead of taking it every day, let's say instead of taking my BPC every single exactly. day, it tells my body to make the BPC every single day. And you say this lasts for like a year or two. Yeah, one half to two years is and, the average time. And now how do you make it, what's reversal? How do you reverse that? Yeah, it's because it's of E. coli origin. You can just take a tetracycline antibiotic and, it'll, <laughs> <laughs> oh, and it's wow. a perfect kill switch. It's, it's, it's a perfect kill switch. We're, we're publishing it wow. in Nature Biotech because it's, uh, it, I mean, I think the scientists who invented it, uh, I'm not the inventor, I work with them. I'm not that smart. I'm just, a, I'm just a guy promoting it, but I work with them obviously closely. The scientists who invented it, I, I, I think he'll get the Nobel Prize uh, because this is a breakthrough technology yeah. and it's going to change the the world. So if if I if I did switch if I did crazy. do this and I had to take antibiotics for something else, then it may stop it and I'd have to try it again. Yeah, yeah, okay. for sure. If you if you had to take tetracycline for whatever reason, uh, you, then you would probably have to get it readministered. Okay. Yeah. Now, people listening, uh, you know, we we just came off the heels of the pandemic, and right away when you're talking about you know gene therapy, I'm thinking mRNA. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm thinking of these vaccines and all the scare fear around. This is different. It's not mRNA. No, it's just plasmid. Plasmids are just, they just exchange information. And this is just one way to exchange information. They're super safe. There's been no documented adverse effects in the five years it's been studied. Um, and obviously in our phase one trial, that was for safety. There was no adverse effects at all. Um, I've done it on myself. I've done it for my parents. I've done it for many patients and high-level pro athletes. Uh, high-level pro athletes is a really interesting area because... Uh, because it can increase neurological drive and it can increase strength and it can increase recovery. It reduces your intrinsic biological age, which is really interesting because intrinsic biological age is usually not modified by lifestyle. And so typically intrinsic biological age is something everyone's kind of like the holy grail of how do we modify right. this? And so because it actually looks at a cellular level, how your body's aging. And one injection, if you're over 60, can reduce your intrinsic biological age by average 11 years. But if you're if you're in your 50s, like six, seven years, uh, so it's pretty significant. But we've had some people who are super responders, like one of the girls who did it, uh, she's 28, her intrinsic biological age, and then her age went down to 12. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> we made her into a child. Would it make me contagious? Let's say I do this and then I go and, you know, make out with my wife or something like that. No. Is she going to catch my... No, the plasmid, the plasmid literally. So we, we say we inject it in your fat. And Depends your... on what kind of stuff you guys are doing. Well, I mean, yeah. 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 So yeah, they're yeah. transmitting. Uh, yeah, yeah exactly. It, li it literally just stays in that area and just sends that signal to produce a peptide. Okay. So it wouldn't be contagious. Sexual no. Trans okay. No. That stuff. Yeah. Wow, this is so potentially. Uh, could this technology be used to teach my cells to make anything? Like, what if I wanted more opiates? What if I wanted more? Yeah, no, there's so many targets, right? And so we have a whole pipeline of products, and uh, you know, the sky's the limit, really, because we can do any protein or peptide. And the cool thing about this, unlike CRISPR Cas9, CRISPR is like the gene editing technology yeah. that mm -hmm. a lot of people know about. That can have offsite targets. This has no offsite targets. It's specifically 100% accurate. Wow. Okay. Wow. And you mentioned you had mentioned also that you could even do this with hormone replacement. So if my testosterone is low, rather than doing my weekly testosterone injection, you could do this and it will tell my body to produce more testosterone. Yeah. So that's probably our fourth product. So our second product will be something called Clotho, which is a peptide that can increase intelligence, uh, prevent uh, neurodegeneration, protects your kidneys. And then the next one after that is going to be copper peptide because copper, uh, your levels decrease as you get older. Right. It's really good for skin health and like anti-aging cosmetics. Uh, and then testosterone is the one after that. And testosterone essentially everyone knows is the problem is like you said, you have to inject yourself once or twice a week. It, a lot of people find it a hassle. This way you just do one injection and it'll maintain your levels for one and a half to two years and we can titrate the dosing. I was just going to say, like, how do you control whether or not I'm making too much? Like, or yeah, we somebody can titrate. Like, yeah, we can, I'm making 5,000 milligrams. Of no, we can CO. titrate it. And that's the, that's the beauty of it. Yeah. We would obviously do a blood test after like a month of it and then you can titrate it. And you can reduce that. it. Or yeah. Why those four in that order? 
Um, we, uh, market, market, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and then we don't, we want to go after like rare genetic conditions too, like, you know, cystic fibrosis, cause that's a missing peptide or protein. Right. Uh, and that causes a buildup of the secretions, but that obviously we want to make revenue first and then we can reinvest that into the rare diseases. But right. the biggest market is anti-aging longevity, yeah. cosmetics, low hanging right? fruit, low hanging and, fruit. And yeah. are you able to do any of this in the States? Uh, no, unfortunately, Montana, we could we can do it in Montana because Montana's governor recently approved phase one drugs. So that's the only state we could do it in. So we're probably going to open a clinic there. But I heard Florida's governor, I mean, just, you know, he's he, DeSantis. He's yeah. he's pretty, uh, he doesn't care about the FDA either. So I think yeah. he's going to also follow suit soon. So Florida and Montana are probably going to be good two spots we can hopefully do. Never going to happen here in California. No. Yeah, yeah. This would be the last yeah. one. Yeah, this would probably be the last one. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. So, and you you had some big investors in this. You can't, can you name any? Can you talk about? Yeah, I mean, Thiel Capital, Pierre okay. Thiel, the PayPal guy, he's mm -hmm. our main Just back. to add some authenticity <laughs> to, you know, to this. Like, this For sure, yeah. No, like I think having someone like that to, it's a, a, the money's important, but B, protection in yeah. a lot of ways too, because you are disrupting an entire industry. Uh, and anytime you're disrupting an industry, people are going to come after you. There's already negative press about our stuff. And it's not just any industry either. I mean, no, there's got to be, are you a little nervous, a little scared at well, all? I've been told yeah, I should get a bodyguard, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah that's why you're traveling. I take the guy who's just scared of a cockroach. That's who you want to be. That's who you want. Yeah, you can be my bodyguard. That's true. You got the look. You got the. You just need to get shaver hands. Skull tattoo. Skull tattoo. Wow. Yeah. Jordan, are you able to? Are you able to talk? Have you tried any of this? Are you able to talk about? I was it? supposed no. to get it for. We got to do it for you. You know, know what? We're we're ships passing in the night, and when I, whenever we see each other, there's always an athlete in between us. So <laughs> now that I moved back to Toronto, I have do a myriad sure, of yeah. different issues. So I've been. I've been just having been proof of concept of my own principles of like out functioning the day. Like I don't have an ACL in my left knee. I tore my right pack. I've separated both AC joints, dislocated both shoulders, torn labrums in both shoulders. So, uh, but yeah, I'll be the $6 million man now on the table. One now that we're back in the same, in the same town. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Is it expensive? It's 25,000 for one shot. Okay. But if you think about it, it's almost lasting two years and it, for people who are into this stuff, like they don't mind paying, I think for the most part. Uh, and my my thing too with this stuff is, is it is a new technology, right? So think about plasma TVs in like yeah, 2003 right, right. or whatever. They used to be like, some of them were like hundred thousand dollars, sure, yeah. you know, and, but they came down precipitously. And same thing with like, I, my, um, you know, my kind of like way to equate it is with like uh, electric vehicle batteries, like EV battery manufacturing was really expensive and really difficult in 2010. The Teslas weren't very good back then. Yeah. They didn't go very far. The batteries were pretty crappy, but people still bought them because in the hopes that this is going to lead to a brighter future for society. Right. And that's my same principle with cell and gene therapy. Cell and gene therapy manufacturing, the process is improving because there's bioreactors. There's different ways that we can bring down the cost curves. So instead of costing like even even 10 years ago, like or even five years ago, stem cells, like IV stem cells were like 50,000. And now they're like 25,000. And like in another five years, they'll be like, 10,000. Yeah. And the same thing with the gene therapy. The manufacturing process will keep improving. And as the demand goes up, we can bring down the cost. Okay. So the evil scientist in me is like, th th if this technology is out, um, I think uh, high level, extreme cosmonaut athletes, bodybuilders, whatever, are going to get their hands on this and go crazy. I mean, what do you think, Jordan? Yeah, regulation is always tough, right? The wantingness to cheat is always going to be higher than the wantingness to catch. Yeah, how do cheating. you test somebody's body that's naturally making? Uh, you know, I think the one thing you have to be comfortable with is at the highest <laughs> level that people aren't getting tested, mm -hmm. right? And at a certain point, there is a there's a maximum amount of recoverability that's useful before the actual skill of the athlete shines through. So I think sports are as fair now as they're ever going to be on that front. I see because more testosterone doesn't equal more. So, and they've hit a the lot of, and you know what, in the sports that we love to watch, they really, and I think sports in general have gone down this trajectory of being more skill based, right. And, and changing the rules fundamentally so that the skill can be expressed. Cause that's what we like, yeah. right. The TSN top 10 is always going to be some high velocity transverse plane movement, right? Like mm -hmm. a spin or a catch or whatever. Sure. Right. So I, it's, you know what, I think there's a lot to talk about in professional <laughs> sports as they intersect with medicine. Like we talked earlier about, you know, the best team surgeons are going to be often seen as the best surgeons. Oh, my kid goes to see the Miami Dolphins team surgeon. It's like when you start to understand a little bit about every every professional sports organization right now, to my knowledge, is actually operating illegally under federal med legal operation mm -hmm. law. So like you think of all the incentives for medicine in the Bay Area at a corporate level, right? Apple, Google, Facebook, right. Pinterest, they all have 
medical care incentivized. I, I was a chiropractor at Apple, but my badge, you know, I had an Apple badge to get into the building, but my employer wasn't Apple. My employer was Crossover Health because it's illegal to, to protect them. Yes, you have to do that. But every single pro sports team is in violation. There's actually a study done in, at Harvard called the, the Harvard Football Study, and it talks a little bit about this. But I think it's really going to start to make waves in the next couple of years. By my estimation, every pro sports league in the United States, at the very least right now, is under an in like incredible amount of uh, or is in an incredibly vulnerable position in the way they've structured their medical teams at the sports organization because none of them are protected. Mm. I go and hire someone. Well, that's illegal under the law that it says you're it's not it's not legal to incentivize medical care. You're financially oh. incentivizing medical care. Every right. team is liable <laughs> right now. There's there's a huge opportunity to restructure at the pro sports level its intersection with medicine. And I think, you know, what a deal is doing is going to be a massive part of that conversation. Because you know, they're good, you're going to need to have a governing body that's not owned by the leagues. And sure. Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, NHL. You have to. Yeah. Right. Apple follows suit and understands the med legal route. That's why you have like crossover health or uh, one or whatever runs Google. But pro sports teams don't. Mm -hmm. It's like, look, I, yeah. musculoskeletal injuries at Apple. Trust me, I work there. <laughs> <Not> that, <laughs> right? It's not. So my wrist hurts. It's like because yeah. you've been coding for so. 30 yeah. years, right? <laughs> but, you know, I think part of that conversation will be because ultimately it's going to be good business, mm. right? Like, I, I think you're starting to see, uh, you know, the athletes like you know, kind of in the tennis world, like Novak Djokovic, for example, right? Novak Djokovic has been on top of his game for 20 yeah. years. The guy wins. 92 percent of matches that he plays that's insane yeah, that's right crazy. and but you know a guy like novax he has to go out and build his team right where you, if you're a pro athlete coming up in north america and you're playing one of like the big four sports hockey baseball mm -hmm. basketball or uh, football you're under the assumption that the team has your best interest at heart and they don't right because it's about the bottom line but i think there's there's a potential for alignment Right? And that alignment is going to be aligning the best interests of the financial outcomes of the institutions with the best in the best interests of the health outcomes of the athlete. Right. And I think this is going to be a big part. No, of that. 100 percent yeah. makes sense. You know, you mentioned something interesting to me. So the evolution of sports uh, and how they've used cutting edge technology kind of looks like this. It was like, what can we use to make us stronger, bigger, faster? Then it was like, what can we use to recover faster, heal faster? Seems like we're kind of there right now. You mentioned skill acquisition. That's the brain. Do you see the future of this kind of stuff uh, or, or this kind of medicine or let's say advanced applications being more about like, how can we get your brain to learn technique and skill faster? How can we improve your per perceptive ability? How can we improve your ability to- That's already helping with sports teams. I mean, yeah. the Warriors, or are they were, doing the Warriors were one of the first to adopt the-, the um, what was the, the, was not, is it Halo? That was the, 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 yes. the headgear that there was, they would practice together so they could measure like their, all their, their, what was going yeah, on their brain of, while they were playing. Yeah, and we stuff. think of cognitive performance enhancers being like, oh, top Silicon Valley so and so uses whatever to think, you know, but athletes, right? Is that, is that a big space for athletes as well? Uh, okay, I'm going to try and say this diplomatically <laughs> because it deals here. Yes, but it's not in the way that people think. Okay. Right? Brain training and watching, you know, pro athletes fucking tap little yeah. blue lights on right. a wall. Sorry, that's not how it works. Sure. Right? Like, sure. you know, understanding the intersection of cellular physiology and, and neuroscience is where these conversations need to be had. And when we start to look at common like brain training drills that are like, I'm going to throw like a, one of those tripod sticks at you and you need to catch the red arm. Right. It's like, right. Dog. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's so um, far from what you're doing in your sport. Well, it's, it's not even that like novelty in exercise, novelty in exercise for athletes is I think a good thing, right. Or variability in exercise, right. right, right? right. Like, you know, I, I always talk about this principle of the uncanny Valley when it comes to sports and strength and conditioning. So like the uncanny, uncanny Valley is like a term born out of robotics. And I think it has like a really good carryover to sports. So kind of like just indulge me for a second. The uncanny Valley explains human likeness to things that look like humans. Right. So it plots it on a graph. So on the X axis, it's like, you know, how much something looks like a human. If you mm -hmm. can imagine that, like something that doesn't look like a human at yeah, all. Banana, with chimpanzee. A, a human. Yeah. With yeah. a human being itself. Right. Also me being the, 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 the holy grail of what we're after. And then the Y axis would be, well, 
how much does it look like us? Mm -hmm. Right. So you see this trend and like a lot of us kind of know this uh, inherently. If you ever watch like a, a creepy, you know, post-apocalyptic sci-fi zombie movie or something, you're like, like, or X Mac and you know, guys, that's usually that. yeah, sick movie. Great movie. Yeah. So like, let's plot like Wally, -E, right? The little microwave on Mars, mm -hmm. the Disney right. thing. It's like, it has some anthropomorphized features to it. But it's still a microwave on right, space, right. right? Or whatever it is. Right. It's not. It doesn't. You're not have mistaken it for being human, right? So that's like plots pretty low. We we're whatever about it, but it doesn't look like us. So that's like kind of in the corner of the Y and the X axis. But as we start to plot up and think about like minions, holy fuck, do people love minions? Like full grown adults lose their mind with these little yellow things wearing overalls. But then they're slightly more anthropomorphized, right? Like anthropomorphizing yeah. like humans. And then you go up to like Simpsons or Family Guy. We're like, oh. It's like or the real world, but Marge has like three feet tall blue hair. Sure. But then you get into like this weird valley of like looking a lot like humans. So we've, we've trended up right from Wally -E to Minions to Peter Griffin. And then there's like this fucking just, just tanks. And it tanks when things look too close to us, but aren't us. They look oh, uncanny or scary. That's the uncanny mm -hmm. valley. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you peek up when you actually see people you like. like right. How many of us after COVID, when we left our house, like, oh my God, like other yeah, human beings. Yeah. Amazing. It's mm -hmm. like looking at those scary dolls made in the early 1900s Not where stupid. they may try to make them look like people, but you're like, that looks <gasps> scary. Yeah. Freaky, right? right? Exercise is a lot like that for right. sports. Okay. Where it's like- So it's it good, 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 uh, not, nothing. And it looks too, too much like the thing we do on the field. Got it. Right? So what the idea that I'm going to you know, that. I'm gonna <laughs> yeah. attach my cable, my Titleist to a carabiner and I'm going to start working on my 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 three wood Got in it. the gym. It's like no no no, hold on. There's general properties of strength, agility. Uh, Is this it, because it doesn't it, it doesn't translate uh, enough to uh, counter the fact that it's messing you up with the technique and skill of something that's too close to it? Yeah, there's things in okay. athleticism that can be trained in the gym, and there's yeah. things that can't. Right, right. athleticism right. has. Honestly, athleticism, athleticism honestly has more to do with uh, rhythm and mm -hmm. timing sure. than it does uh, endurance, intensity, and velocity. Of course. Yeah. But in, endurance, intensity, and velocity are attributes or physical properties that we can train in the gym. But we don't want to mess up the rhythm the rhythm and timing and the sensory input component right. of what we were so doing So there's a the strength field. of a deadlift, but there's a technique and skill of a deadlift. So and you, you can improve your technique and skill and lift more weight and not necessarily be have muscles that contract harder. Right. Yeah, you exactly. Will. So you okay. saying that makes me think that the the type of peptide or whatever we would come up with for cognitive function would be something that you would use with your training. Well, with yeah, your practice. And that actually like speeds up your ability to get into flow state. Something like that. Yeah. Would that be, I, would, is, is that would, would be the good guess on what the direction you would want to go versus trying to? Yeah. I mean, right now, the big doping issue in sports is the illegal or the banned substances around like this, you know, the advanced nootropics. Like if anyone's ever taken an Adderall or a modafinil, like the pro sports like or pro baseball at the very least, they're said to be the three A's of the MLB, alcohol, Ambien, and Adderall. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. That's like, that's the truth of it. Right. Wow. So people are looking at what like microdosing uh, uh, mushrooms. I've heard that. What's is, up? Is it a microdosing trend, mushrooms? Microdosing oh, sure. Yeah. And, and I mean, there's neuroprotective benefits yeah. to things like that as well. And the shrooms are, I'm probably not the best qualified to talk about that. <laughs> but if you look at you know, where people are really honing in their attention, it's like anabolics, 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 yeah. like anabolic androgenic steroids. Right. It's not really it. The games aren't built for that anymore. The cognitive stuff is where we start to see a, like a lot of the cheating in the short. That's time. what mm -hmm. I was asking. Yeah, yeah. Because with anabolics, I think we've hit the peak. We yeah. figured yeah. it out and yeah. we figured out which ones make you bigger, which ones give you more neural drive, which one give you whatever. And then now they figured out the combination of the perfect amount for size, speed, neural drive, feel good, whatever. But now there are lots of, pep I've, I use them. So I use certain peptides for cognitive performance. And I notice significant improvements in my recall, in my fluency, in just how sharp I am Have on the tried, podcast. Have uh, you intranasal insulin? I Say what? Intranasal insulin. insulin. No, I've used well, C-Max that way, but not insulin. No, yeah, no, I know. It's better yeah. than that. So intranasal insulin has been used for uh, dementia and mild cognitive impairment. But Is people, that because... Uh, because a lot of people say it's like dementia and mild cognitive impairment is type 3, type three diabetes, diabetes basically, because yeah. uh -huh. you get insulin resistance and neuroinflammation in the brain. So intranasal insulin, you can be used for optimization for a cognitive <laughs> enhancement. So try it out. It's pretty good. You do like and is that because IU. it increases the that glucose uptake and usage exactly. in the brain? Exactly. So it just turbocharges. And, and, and the beauty part is it's not going to affect your blood sugar because it just goes down your digestive system if you put extra in or whatever. What? It's just going up your nose, right? So 
Wow. <laughs> Jordan, super safe. This. Okay. Super safe. And again, because it's not patented, you won't hear about it, but day. it's actually an effective treatment for dementia. And like, it's crazy. When I found out about that, I was like, I was like, and if you look on PubMed and like all the research around it, it's just crazy because like when you go to your average doctor, they're just like, there's nothing you can do for dementia. There's these crappy drugs that barely work, mm -hmm. you know, and there's something simple like intranasal insulin can actually make a big difference. And obviously we, we can combine that like we do, we do with stem cell injections too into the brain. Um, like I have an interventional radiologist in Dubai who does that with me. So it's- Whoa, like, whoa, whoa, you inject into the brain? Yeah, yeah, he goes in directly. Um, there's actually a good trial that just came out recently for Parkinson's disease uh, using um, those iPSC cells I was talking mm -hmm. about. And it's, it's actually, uh, it's a phase one safety trial, but it essentially so these, tr these cells can actually generate new neurons and generate new dopamine producing neurons. So the people in the treatment groups actually have like sustained benefits and to treat their Parkinson's disease. Do you get dopamine uh, side effects from something like that? Because I, I can get really sensitive to dopamine where I start to feel a little crazy and very Im uh, impulsive. Well, these are patients who basically aren't making, because they're, okay. they're part, they have Parkinson's. So oh, they're not oh, making okay. dopamine. You're not giving this to normal people. No, no, no. No, okay. this is for Parkinson's specifically. I make my brain make Adderall, basically. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh <laughs> <laughs> wow. Off the wall. Wow. So you're, you, you mentioned Dubai a few times. Some of the most, some of your biggest or customers got to be out there because they're on the cutting edge and they got money. Yeah, no, I got called to the uh, the richest family in the world. They're worth 3.2 trillion, their palace. And uh, they're, you know, when you treat those type of people, you get access and you get also, it kind of, uh, you know, gives you a different perspective too. Because it's like, it doesn't matter how much money you have, everyone has health issues. <laughs> and yeah. so and so if you could help them. And, and the other thing for me was like, if, cause sometimes I'm like, I question myself. I'm like, am I in the wrong here? Cause why am I going against the narrative? You know what I mean? Why yeah. am I going against the mainstream? So I'm wondering if, am I wrong? But then I'm like, Look at the people I'm working with. Yeah. So obviously it just, it helps to reinforce that maybe I am on the right track because yeah. I, I feel like they wouldn't seek me out if I was crazy. Yeah. Well, wow. at least I don't think I would. They would so I feel like I already know your answer, but I'd like to ask anyway. You mentioned, was it Montana? Will they allow phase one yeah. trials? Okay, so I have personal experience with this. I had a family member who had terminal uh, cancer years ago. And I remember there were trials of drugs that could potentially help, but we had to try to apply and maybe get it. And I remember being so frustrated she's going to die anyway. Yeah. You gave her four months. Yeah. She should be able to exactly. ask for heroin. Whatever she wants. Yeah, she yeah. should be able to ask yeah. for Molly, cocaine, whatever the fuck she wants. Oh, yeah. She's going to die anyway. And yet she can't because of these strange regulations. Don't you think a process like, uh, here's a coding system or a color system. Here are drugs that have been tr uh, exactly. tested on animals. Use it at your own risk. Here's drugs that have been tested, you know, phase one, phase two, phase three. These are the approved ones. Use it at your own risk. It's up to you. Don't, don't you feel like that would be a much better? Because right now it costs, what, a billion dollars? to take a drug from conception to market, which basically means if you can't patent it or you don't already have a prequel to it, in other words, another opiate or whatever, like, why would I even innovate? Why would exactly. I spend a billion dollars to try to f invent something? When no, I the system here is designed to feed itself. And that's why we have to go into these other jurisdictions where the regulation isn't like this and it allows us to bring real world, it, it's called real world evidence. Does this, does this shit work or not? Yeah. Like that's, that's basically what it comes down to. And the analogy I always use is like, like, would you do a randomized control trial to see if parachutes work? Like, do you want yeah. to be in the placebo group for that? <laughs> like, like, Here's the like, control group. To yeah. They all die. Yeah. <laughs> like, Cross fingers. Yeah. Wow. So, you know, it's just like, uh, sometimes you have to look at practicality and like peptides are a perfect example of that. Like there are, there's not a single human RCT on peptides yet. You guys know firsthand how many people are using them. Yeah. Like, come oh, on. I, I'll like, tell you, they're, they're remarkable. Yeah. I, I, and so, so, but if you, but if you go to your doc, if you go to a doctor still, they'll be like, oh, there's no RCTs. It's like, bro, like you have to look at real world evidence. So, I'll, I'll give you a great example of this. Um, so the U.S. government recognized that uh, more troops were committing suicide than were dying on the battlefield a while ago. Yeah. And so they funded they funded um, research into MDMA, ketamine, uh, psilocybin, all of which, like psilocybin, for example, can't really patent it. Ketamine, it's already been legal forever. Like, it, but they funded it because they're like, we got to figure this out. Now the research is coming out, right? Yeah. I, I'm doing ketamine therapy right now. And it is remarkable at how effective it is. It's absolutely remarkable. If you look at the research, it could, I mean, it's, it could treat treatment resistant depression exactly, and yeah. really bad PTSD, which has no eff efficacious treatment right now uh, on the market. Well, we do. But you don't make any money yeah, with exactly. it. Ketamine's cheap. A compound pharmacy makes exactly. it. I spend, the money I spend is with the therapist. Yeah. The ketamine's cheap as fuck. So I'm seeing this firsthand. Well, we combine. That's why you know I had a patient in Canada. They recently approved uh, medically assisted dying. 
I had this guy, he's a special forces uh, operative and he's, uh, he got medically discharged because he had really bad PTSD. And so he, they basically said he has, he's like, he has like four kids. He failed like the traditional PTSD treatment. So they're just like, well, I guess you can kill yourself. Like, I was just like, that's like, that's messed up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I was like, what can I do? So I started digging into it a little bit from an interventional mental health perspective. And so there's actually something called a stellate ganglion injection um, where you actually inject into the stellate ganglion, which is around here and the vagus nerve. Right. And so the vagus nerve and stellate ganglion both feed into your parasympathetic nervous system. And so we actually can inject peptides and anesthetic into here and it actually resets your nervous system. We call it the V-shot. And I'm working with the Canadian military to get it covered for the veterans. And I've done it for many people and it's oh, changed. It takes me five minutes and it changes their life. And we combine it. We can combine it with like psilocybin assisted therapy. I was just going to say, then they do We therapy. combine it. Exactly. We combine it. That's the best. It just allow, what does it do? Just improve neuroplasticity or allow it, it, it allow, the rewiring of what's happening? Exactly. Rewiring. Yeah. And the mm -hmm. neuromodulation of the nervous system because then they don't have the same response and triggers to every every little thing. Wow. Um, it's, it, I've, I've even I've treated young girls and got them off like, you know, anxiety meds, panic attacks. Like it's been crazy. Uh, and it's just it's such a simple thing. And it's just using literally one injection, like peptides, some anesthetic and just in the vagus nerve. And we do wow. it on both sides. I don't know if I feel more excitement or anger. Exactly. Right yeah, That's how I felt. Like it's, kind of it's like it's exciting like, at the same time. It's like so fuck it makes me so angry to know that you have got all these things that just could literally change the game. Listen, it's it's yet it's, not everybody isn't talking it's about an, it. It's an an unfortunate side effect of the system that we have, right? We want really crazy regulations, but because of the cost, you have to recoup your investment. If you can't patent it, why the hell would I invest it? So it's just part of the system. Um, so I don't blame it, but I do think it could be revamped and changed. And it is angering. I almost feel like I'm talking to the guy who said, hey, look, I created an engine that runs off of water. And then he disappears. Later. It feels if like what that, you're huh? saying is true, yeah. are you worried? So how do you guys work together? Why do you guys travel together? What's the deal with Yeah, that? I mean, we're, we're, like I said, we're passing ships in the night, okay. right? So, and one thing I like, even in, you know, as he was kind of, going over the like the V shot and talking about the applications of some of these drugs with you know PTSD and depression like you notice he always mentioned like the intervention after yes right that we're following up with of course right and that's and that's how we kind of that's why I've, I've been drawn to him over the years is and him to me is you know it, it, it these things are going to open up a window to allow you to change a habit or a lifestyle or a motor pattern or something so there's it's a it's a it's a good um like it's a good synergy in, in the way we practice mm. because you know he'll give me an opportunity a window to change the mechanics of the way someone is is moving or playing their sport so that we can you know begin to underload chronically loaded tissues that tore and begin to you know disperse load across different tissues in a way that's going to be regenerated over time where long term it was or short or sorry in the past it was just always going to be cortisone 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 yeah. right which had the catabolic effect so you know we we understand the limits of our scope so if i have something complex where you know i can arrive to a conclusion pretty quickly now and just been doing this for a while of like hey i know the injury i know the sport i know the intensity i know the endurance i know the velocity i know the demands that you're gonna need and this tissue won't hold up to it so you need to go fix the tissue and then when we come back, then we actually, you know, then we start targeting. You know. For people listening, is this a fair analogy, right? Because I used to work with massage therapists and massage gives you an often, oftentimes immediate but temporary relief. Oh, we tightened up, we loosened up the tight muscles. Your CNS is telling you to stay tight. They're loose. But if you don't train and retrain movement patterns or correctional exercise, you'll just go back to the massage therapist next week. So he's kind of doing that. Then you're going in and then you're training them or moving them in ways that then solve the problem. Yeah. Yeah. If you zoom out enough, that's kind of the relationship for sure. Okay. Um, but that's essentially, and vice versa, right? right? Like, you know, there's, there's some things and I'm very mindful of this, like in the stuff that we teach, like, you know, a, I think one of the biggest things that I think is worth talking about is you can't out corrective exercise, bad exercise, right? Athletes move terribly in the gym. They, they are the shape and function of their sport because they do it the most. That's right. Yeah. Right. So bridging the gap between corrective exercise and exercising correctly is like a big part of what we do. But also like on the flip side with him, it's a matter of like, I know that this tissue will be chronically loaded. I need to get him to repair that tissue. So I can so go back and start getting them to use other tissues, mm. right? So that's that's sort of the give and take. Is 
you know, he knows the limitations of his and I know the limitations of mine. I, I focus more on a constraints based model that focuses more on my limitations than the benefits mm. because that's where I can capture. Like that's where I can kind of know where, Hey, I dude, where are you at? Oh, I'm in Miami next week. Okay. I'll fly in with my guy and can you jab? Okay. But I got to leave the next day. Cause I got to go to Mexico. It's like, okay, we got to leave the next day. Cause we got to go to the Bahamas. Okay. So this day, all right, we'll meet here. Okay. Bring your radiologist. And then we're, we're sort of just passing ships in the night because it's we both understand the limitations of what we do which More means so, you guys can work together yeah and that's and i think a lot of people you know you get lost when you focus on the benefits because like you pump yourself up and you get these great results but if you know where your limitations are then you'll make better decisions well yeah if you're a hammer everything's a nail but if you realize you only can work with nails then that's what you're gonna yeah so i, I want to ask you something how do you know working with high level athletes jordan how do you know when to correct a movement pattern issue gonna ask the same or question. this is beneficial for their sport. I'm not going to fuck with this because if I do, it's going to mess up their technique or their whatever. Yeah. I mean, there's like a simple framework to follow. We talked earlier about like the stimuli of uh, endurance, intensity and velocity and then mm -hmm. into like rhythm and timing and more athletic endeavors. So seeing how a tissue tolerates those like, hey, can you do hold this for position for a long enough period of time? Mm -hmm. No. OK, that's going to be a big problem. Right. You, you know, uh, you play 162 games in the major leagues uh, or you play a 17 week schedule or, you know, you're a fucking tennis player and you play for five hours in a grand slam and you're best of five sets. Like understanding the progression of stimuli from endurance, intensity, velocity, right. rhythm and timing. And then being like, can the tissue tolerate that? So titrating down to like each individual stimulus at that level of tissue and being like. Hey, yeah, you can tolerate this. Is it is it load intensive or is it is it load dependent? Right? Is the is the issue load dependent? No. Okay, let's try velocity. Okay, it hurts when you're out of velocity. What velocity? Can we come down and start to work at submaximal velocities of a stimulus and start to build the threshold there? Right. So that's like one one offshoot of progression that we look at. The second is planes of motion, right? So frontal or sagittal, frontal, and transverse in that order. Our body gets more complex as we organize movements through each of those planes uh, in order. So sagittal is very basic, right? Front and back, flexion, extension. We're kind of, we're that's our that's our that's reptilian brain. We're up. That's right. our default. That's our safe mode. And right. most people will default back to that. Like we talked about TSN Sports top ten list. You'll never see high endurance sagittal plane in the top ten. It's boring. Right. That's why powerlifting is never on the top 10. It's, it's <laughs> slow and it's sagittal plan. Right. Yeah. Right. Where, what are the two most exciting things? High velocity, well-timed, like the dunk yes. contest to me. And like, I know you're a ball fan, but what are we doing here? Yeah. We're just <laughs> trying to spin more. That's yeah. all it was. It was on the <laughs> Tony Hawk pro skater yeah. shit. Yeah. The white uh -huh. dude just jumped up uh -huh. and did a 900 or whatever. Yeah. And then that was it. Why? Because it's high velocity transverse plane motion. That's right? interesting so, when you unpack it like that. Yeah. So can, that we're naturally drawn to that. Oh yeah. Because well, we, like, even even if you're yeah. not an, even if you're not an athlete or even appreciate sports, like maybe someone like Sal, you still subconsciously appreciate that because there's something in our brain that tells us that's, that's fucking hard. Super difficult. So difficult. muscles are our second most abundant sensory organ in the body. And I think we don't appreciate that coming out of the resistance training world because we train them for motor output and not sensory input. Like if we close our eyes right now, what's going to tell us where we are? Right. Know, we have we have subcutaneous mechanoreceptors. There's four major ones, Ruffini endings, endings and Merkel's distant Meisner's core muscles and Piscinian endings. And those manage like vibration and deep pressure and light touch and skin stretch and all that shit. Right. But the real money when it comes to the way we map our brain internally and this kind of leads back into the conversation we had about how can you improve the cognitive function of an athlete? It's like the, the answer is in the muscle, right? The muscle is the conduit into the nervous system. There's 50,000 muscle spindles in the muscles in your body, which makes it the second most abundant sensory organ in our body. The first obviously is our eyes, right? It's like how we map, uh, how humans map. Right. A dog would map his environment with olfactory, right? right? With nose, yeah, smelling. So with us, it's eyes, but the second those go out, it's muscles that are telling us what mm -hmm. to do, right? That's why we love the TSN, the top 10, the number one thing is always the no look or the mm -hmm. eyes closed, right? Oh, like, yeah. or he's, you know. Like, oh shit, he Steph's putting look. it up and he's like <laughs> looking at you in the eyes when he does it. It's like, well, that's a sign of mastery because you know, we can get into like Sarah Butler function it maybe in another time, but when, if we knock out our main system, our second system there to tell us where we are in space, other than like you know, the motor patterns that we've suggested and Steph's probably made that shot 10,000 times in his right. life. It's the muscles in real time that are telling us like right. kind of this internal motion capture system where we are in space. 
right? So, you know, we talk about sagittal plane being the most com or most basic, frontal slightly more complex, and sagittal, or sorry, transverse being the most complex. So now we have two, pro two progressions. And then we look at movement, right? When we're dealing with an injury, there's always the ability to move passively, active assisted, active and active resisted. So we kind of take these three filters and we kind of kaleidoscope them together and see, given the, the, you know, the, the known biomechanics of the joint or tissue that's injured, where are we at? Like where, what's our starting point? Like it, it's passive, it's painful in passive sagittal plane motion. Okay. That's dude. I'm looking at him right away. I got a guy that I can't lift his leg off the table without him screaming. He can't right, cause you're it. at the beginning. You're at the first level of both of those. Right. They're colliding. You're like, this is we're yeah. way. P yeah. So there's a lot of will exist in the middle ground and that's where just a gap analysis and experience comes Interesting. in. Interesting. Right. And then, then it gets into more finite things of like, you know, what type of, what type of athlete is this guy in the sport? Right. Like what, how, what type of game does he play? Right. You know, then and this is where you're talking about the limitations. Sure. Oh, I see. Yeah, now yeah, using yeah. that filter, can someone like you, like the other day I, I tagged uh, you and like three of our other friends. That I Nuts, think are the most, by the way, uh, that's so are, weird to see me on that. Bro, so I mean, you guys you. are, you guys are the most br brilliant people in the sports performance world, in my opinion, that I've, I've ever seen or spoken to. Can you use that filter and, and, and see like, let's say some other trainer that's not on that list posts like working with an athlete and you automatically can go like this fucker doesn't know what he's doing just is it that can you do that i it's, mean yeah but it's tough like in the sports world the longer you do it the more you realize that optimal is 51 percent, not 100 the house always wins that's what you're aiming for randomness is great novelty is great but mm -hmm. we just need specific novelty right we need specific variability outside of the planes of motion look some people pick it up with their eyes closed right a blind squirrel can find a nut every now and then Right. And, and mm -hmm. I, I've been around long enough to know, and kind of to a deal's point earlier, like there's immutable principles of movement and exercise right. that are, are going to be ever present regardless of your dogma or ethos sure. or your education, what you think we know about training. Because right now, and you know, we talked earlier uh, about my friend, he's, uh, and his name's Andy O'Brien. He's Sidney Crosby strength coach, probably one of the most brilliant guys that I know. And he's like, we maybe know 5% of what there is to know right now. <laughs> right. So like you do this enough times and like, you know, it's frustrating when people don't have a system because we're trying to beat randomness and that's not a, no that's not a novel feat. Mm -hmm. Randomness is a dangerous opponent. Right. And we can, and what makes it dangerous is because you can get results with almost anything. It, it fools you. Yeah. It does. Yeah. So like for me, I'm aiming for 51%. Like we talked about Novak Djokovic. Mm -hmm. I got pulled into the tennis world in the last year. You know, Novak Djokovic wins 92% of matches that he plays, which is nuts. You know, he's up until this year, he's won the last eight Wimbledons and he's won, I don't know, 20, 30 plus slams over his 20 year career. But do you know how many points he wins on average? 56%. The best tennis player in the world only wins 56%. Right. So when I watch a coach and look, there was a time. It's a consistent 56, but yeah. Yeah. But the house always wins. Right. Right. So my job is to be the house, right? When I make decisions around, co like whether it's managing or co-managing an athlete or the decision to co-manage an athlete, I'm aiming for a result slightly better than random, which is going to be 50%. Now let me add to that. You're, you're working with very high performance, high functioning, like, like 0.1% of the 1% of people when you're talking about that. When you're talking about the average person who comes in like, oh, my back hurts, mm -hmm. it's more than 51%. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. Look, <laughs> yeah. it's- Like, it, oh, okay, it, you got strengthen your abs or something like that. Right, right. and that's where people <laughs> kind of, because that's how we all start, right? right? And I think that that's where randomness gets really scary because it gives you a false sense of confidence. Well, yeah, you get somebody yeah. just generally stronger and like, oh, this fixed their back pain or yeah. their knee pain. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's it. Like, I mean, a coach that, that teaches with us, uh, Kyle Baxter, he's kind of like coined this phrase of people being weaker than the forces of gravity acting on them. And then we can get into a center of mass conversation and what that really means in application of exercise prescription. But like- it, I look at like a chess board and a checkers board. It's the same fucking board. There's white squares and there's black squares, but what's different are the pieces. The yeah. pieces mean something different depending on what game you're playing. With general population people, you're playing fucking checkers. Just make little jumps. That's it. Get them stronger. Put them on a leg press. I don't give a yeah. shit. You don't Eat need less, to reinvent. Yeah. yeah, you mm -hmm. don't need to reinvent. Yeah, relative strength to body weight ratio, huge. But when you get to the other side of the board and you've you've done your time and you've cut your teeth on the gym floor, and then you know maybe a kid you trained was talented and made it to a college level, or or you know maybe someone you know, you trained someone and knows someone and you get a shot at 
an athlete, it's like you got to understand that you're playing a different game. You're on totally. a different board, right? Now you got the horse moves in the L thing. I'm good at biomechanics, but I don't actually know what the fuck I'm talking about. When it comes to the chess <laughs> reference. The horse moves in the L and like the, the thing that looks like a bowling pin goes on yeah, the, the diagonal. Bishop, bishop, diagonal yeah, yeah, and, sure, yeah. whatever. Queen's yeah, yeah. game. I don't have a TV. Right. But so that's that's like the main difference, right? And really what that comes down to is load management. Right, like it just comes down to a system of load management. That's all it is. Like if I were to distill it down to like what biomechanics is, is it's load management. But That's load management is still a problem, even in an elite level, as we've seen. Some of the trainers are uh, Muppets, as uh, Jordan likes to call them. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we see the shout, shout I mean, that's out. what I was seeking for. I wanted him to point out, like, I could see someone doing something, and then there's, like, a red flag. There's got to be red flags. Oh, gotta sure. Be, and there's red, flag, the high red level flags like on that. either it's side, incredible. right? Yeah. Like, fuck, man. Like, there's 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 modalities, and I don't want to get sued, but there's modalities like, you know, transcutaneous neuromuscular electrical stimulation devices are still rampant yeah. in the sports world. All you're doing is you're going to nerf an athlete that needs to be really strong. Right. If I have a fucking, you know, uh, uh, some doped up the tens unit on my quad, I, what I don't have is 500 pounds on the bar. Right. And there's going to be a time where load management requires because load management is a double edged sword. Right. And we don't realize that, you know, we, we understand that overshooting load, you know, uh, from a training perspective, like probably around the 15 percent mark. Like if we came in today, like I'm feeling pretty good. I found some old Jack, Jack 3D in the cupboard, like time to grip and rip. And you go for a PR that's over 15 percent of a training stimulus that you're used to in the last like 30 days and you got hurt. Yeah, no yeah. shit. Yeah, right, like yeah. you YOLO PR it on some one three die math and you <laughs> fucked up your back. Like, yeah, shit happens. But the opposite is also true underloading under 15% relative stimulus to what you're used to also leads to an increased risk of injury, wow. right? So the it's like a fine load, line. Exactly. Load management is a fine line. And I think, you know, when we get into the sports world, one of the biggest, one of the biggest principles, if we understand that, okay, biomechanics is load management, right? And you need to equate in like Corey's done something remarkable. And I don't think many people really appreciate Corey Schlesinger. Oh, yeah, safe to say friend of the show. Yes. Yes. Huge he's beauty the award. Yeah. Um, <laughs> he's done something interesting. He's actually just taken uh, a job at Texas. Mm -hmm. So he's gone from, uh, and Corey, hopefully I'm not like outing your news here, but he's, we went from taking a strength coach role at uh, the Phoenix Suns yep. to taking an assistant coach role and performance director role. Wow. So that's like the, that's some innovative shit because now you can actually tolerate where load comes from from both ends, mm -hmm. right? Because it's like as a strength coach, conventionally at the collegiate or pro level, you're always playing catch up. You're always playing yeah. reactive. Like an angry coach puts a garbage can in the middle of the court and runs kids until they puke. It's like fuck. Right. You He's one of the only ones I knew managing the, that. What's that? He was one of the only coaches. I, yeah, I, I remember I when, talked he first, to when he first that. introduced us to him and he broke that down. It was one of the things I think we were all blown away by. Like he was the first coach that I ever heard that would adjust his training based off of what right. the other coaches were doing the to their athletes versus the like, this schedule. is my program. Yeah. This is what we yeah. do all the time, which is what you hear from any other coach or yeah. trainer. And it's so load management becomes really difficult. And we're, you know, the, uh, the more, the more control you have over variables, uh, the, the better data you have, the more you can do this. Like, you know, we'll monitor guys in season and, you know, if a guy finds some open field and playing against a weak defense and he can hit 20 plus miles an hour that week, I don't need to touch him at high percent. But if he gets shut down and like the, the offense isn't on the field for much of the game, I can tell you, oh, hey, man, you only max, you know, you got a few strides. You ran for 10 yards. I need you to run something over 90 percent this week. So, on, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, I need to see something above 90 percent, which for you is going to be like 18, 19 miles per hour. Wow. So we can we can stoke that stimulus throughout the season and get them faster over their career. So would you so would you say that's like what makes the, the the art or the beauty of what you do is being able to be right on the closest to that line you can be? Yeah. And the thing is, like a lot of it comes down with your your tolerance for risk. Right. You need to be able to accept the consequences. Shit goes wrong. Right. And like, that's where a lot of trainers will just look at the program and then stick to the program, because if you stick to the program, you blame the program. Mm. Right. So you have to have, you know, a certain ability to tolerate risk. And it's tough when athletes are getting, you know, the athletes are worth nine figures on a consistent basis. Athletes you work with, like, you know, they'll make a hundred million dollars plus in their career. And you need to be comfortable with your experience and the tools that you have to make the decisions. Like it really comes down to awareness over time is what builds instincts. Right. So if you're aware over time, you can start to recognize patterns like, you know, you learn so much subconsciously that gives you an right. inclination that you need to listen to. But only if you're aware. Right. You need to know what you're looking to looking at in your conscious foreground to allow your subconscious background to start picking up and collecting information. Is there any tech that you like or appreciate? Uh, I mean, I look at the big data, man. Like if you really want to look at athlete longevity, 
uh, uh, muscle mass and overall body weight to skeletal mass ratio is probably one of the most undervalued uh, metrics that you could track. Just straight tracking body fat percentage. Well, tracking body fat. So a friend of mine, Chris, well, a friend yeah. of ours, Chris yeah. McClellan yeah. and uh, Aaron Wellman have a, have a way, a system of uh, with a decent amount of accuracy, actually measuring the weight of someone's axial skeleton and appendicular skeleton. So the bones, how much are your bones right. weigh? Hmm. They break it down, which is wild. And, you know, I, I think one of the most honest scientific efforts I've seen, they actually break it down by race and they've been able to collect a tremendous amount of data across, you know, a, a multiplicity of professional sports. And they can say, look, based off of your race, you should carry this many kilograms per kilogram of bone to muscle, Wow! right? Like that's run in lean is going to be, and look, lean doesn't necessarily mean low body fat percent. It means your muscle mass to skeletal mass ratio. Right. So one of that's like one of the biggest predictive factors. Hmm. So I think a lot of the like tech, too much muscle, too little skeletal mass, higher rate of injury, higher rate of injury, too much weight to, right. you know, and so you can break those things down. And also on the flip side, Right, the too little muscle sure. to yeah. bone. So it, it is about optimizing for some of these like really obvious low hanging fruit, and that's probably one of the biggest ones that we'll track. Then, then performance metric. Right, yeah. performance is a proxy by which we make decisions. And I think a lot of people look, I don't want to say too heavily at the data, but you know, the, there's a subjective interpretation that correlates. And that's how you really understand the difference between being tired and being fatigued, right? We can all attest that our best training days will probably come on the days where we felt the worst, right? As a power lifter, and, and I'll put that on the fringe of the, on the sidelines of conventional sports. When I go in, I, you know, my, you know, Dan Green, who was my coach just up the road, I would deadlift after a long day of, you know, working and I, I would feel slow, but objectively it moved fast. And what he would say is like, put more weight on the bar, right? So you need to know how to be da data informed, not data driven. So there is some, you know, some hard line metrics that we look at, but those metrics are just tracking performance right? and more so on the field of play, because that's the objective measure we're looking to improve. Mm -hmm. So do you find those like the most popular tools out there, like irrelevant then when you're you, like, did you literally well, strap I, up? I think this stuff is important because the longevity field, uh, there's a particular doctor who talks a lot about this stuff. And uh, me and Jordan, you know, we <laughs> our text threads are hilarious. <laughs> we just flame so many people. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but because we're, we're unique because we have we understand we're both gym rats, too. We lift. And we understand like the longevity aspect of muscle and how to optimize that. But there's a lot of people out there who are getting attention who are just talking about really outdated stuff. And like, I think what he's talking about from the sensory perspective is so important, but also like muscle being an organ of longevity is kind totally. of like, yeah. like, like, like the concept now, right? I think everyone understands that, but it's like, how do you actually, how do you actually frame it in a way where you're doing it for longevity? How do you actually structure your training? So I think that's the insight that we have that a lot of people don't. And the, the guys who are out there talking the loudest aren't necessarily, you know, putting out the best information. Well, yeah, that's a delicate balance also, right? We talk about that, the, the triangle, right? If you're moving, you, you start to move towards too much muscle, you move away from longevity. If you go too far towards the aesthetics. Well, for the you, average like, person. Yeah, for the average it. person. Like, so there is that fine dance with that also. Yeah, we talk about pro bodybuilders would be an extreme example. Which also, right? yeah. I think, back, back to the beginning topic about steroids, that's why, that's why just taking more steroids and more muscle isn't necessarily ideal at all for athletes, which is why I think we've reached that kind of. Yeah. I mean, thank I look baseball to me. I'm not a baseball guy, but fuck was it ever exciting when like Roger Clemens had a 20 inch neck, <laughs> yeah. right? He's in front of Congress. <laughs> like he's covered up the worst excuses Dude, ever, wire was, <laughs> but it, you know, it was a sideshow. It became yeah. a sideshow and it didn't actually help the sport. Now it's like when you let the skill shine through sports, that's mm -hmm. where, and sports that are more skill heavy are really starting to come up. Like, you know, tennis is now the fifth most popular sport in the world. Look what Messi has done for soccer in the United yeah. States, yeah. right? You see the skill of this guy and you're like, well, fuck, no wonder we didn't like soccer compared to European players. We're watching a bunch of plumbers go out and play soccer, right? It's nuts. <laughs> it's not even fair at some point, but you know, there's an entertainment the earthquakes. value. Because yeah. yeah. like, if we look at most conventional people who, you know, have a ton of muscle mass and we kind of put them through this filter of like, well, do they move well, active resisted in the transverse plane at high velocities with any sort of rhythm and timing? No. Yeah. Right. They're frontal plane monsters. I mean, they're sagittal plane monsters. Like you watch a bodybuilder try and run. He waddles. What's waddling? It's it's global A, B and A, D duction. Yeah. Well, what is that? It's frontal plane movement. Why? Because they don't have any sort of local or global no. access to the transverse plane. 
right? That's not, it's funny as hell to watch yeah. like bodybuilder <laughs> run until he tears a hamstring. But, you know, we, we like performance. Why? Because the performance is entertaining and we're just gluttons for entertainment, right? So, the, and I think this is where like the alignment, a lot of these topics are going to come from. Like, you, you know, it things, these things have to start at the top. The, the big screen TV that sat in the corner of the rich kid's living room that took up 30% of it, that cost $10,000. We needed that rich kid's dad to buy that TV. So I can hang a plasma right. on my office wall for 300 bucks. Right. Right, 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 and that's right. kind of where we're at. And I think there is, there is an alignment coming together from all the different interests, right? I think mainstream uh, medicine is, uh, at, ver at the very least, they're catching on to the, the muscle as a longevity organ. It's finally starting to happen. Uh, there were, no, were almost no studies 20 years ago on longevity and strength. And now you're starting to see a lot of that. Uh, yeah, I think but, that's good. And, and But the best studies out there are like grip strength. Like, you know, that's just because it's a proxy. Exactly. Right? For, it's a proxy. Yeah. But like, imagine if you actually measured like, like force in your lower body extremity, because that's yeah. where a lot of your muscle, your glute muscles. So there's actually yeah. data out there. It's called myosteatosis, which is how much fatty infiltration yep. or gets into the, into the glute or into the rec fat. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Gabriel Lyon was talking about like they, they can actually look at muscle and see if it's quality muscle versus like, yeah, you got lean body mass here, but there's a lot of fat. Yeah, exactly. So myosteatosis is actually a predictor of mortality and people in COVID that they looked at it too. So patients who had uh, more myosteatosis in their glute and the rec fam area were had poor outcomes. So, and that, so it just shows us that like having muscle in the right places and not having that fatty infiltration is so important and protective for systemic disease. But then there's like, like the whole aspect of like injury prevention, stability, and all the other stuff that is a like it's talked about, but not maybe about like the right people and all that stuff. That's yeah, well, you have insulin sensitivity, androgen receptor density of the ability to store glycogen. Well, yeah. And there's something now we know because it, it comes back to like, you know, the exosome stuff we we're talking about earlier. Now we can measure that from the muscle too. There's something called extracellular vesicles, which are exokines and myokines that get released from the muscle. And so these myokines are basically cytokines that are proteins that are signals that get sent and they bypass the blood brain barrier. So they reduce neuroinflammation. They help prevent against dementia. So, so now we understand at a cellular level, how is muscle actually protecting your body. It's so you're saying that muscle also is a major part of the immune system. Exactly. Because of the myokines and exokines, which are only released in response to the stimulus of certain exercise. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I read this uh, study on uh, an extreme um, form of athlete when it comes to muscle building, pro bodybuilders, <clears throat> not the healthiest. Okay. Obviously they do a lot of shit that'll kill most people. And yet their rate of cancer, their death rate of cancer was lower than the average person just to, just to highlight the protective benefits of muscle it even countered all the shit that they do to their bodies that's totally unhealthy well you're not even unhealthy in a lot of cases like if you got guys that are running a drug called incrolex you you're literally going in with something so incrolex is like the pharmaceutical name for igf1 right so not only is it not healthy the the ability for exercise mm -hmm. to put out the fire while the arson is still lighting the fire yeah. is pretty amazing <laughs> wow. right and the, i think the, something that like a principle that we've seen or a theme that we've seen and I think we'll continue to see as we move forward and we continue to innovate on like the regenerative side or the exercise is moving towards principle-based interventions. Research is too slow, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Like everything that like we've used research, the research proves that you can know how to read. That's it. That's all it does. So every single, you know, you scroll through your gram and, you know, I have friends that do it, colleagues that do it. And like, I get it, you know, the algorithm, whatever. There's some yellow bullshit text over some, a new study shows yeah. 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 principles. Right. We've, we, exactly. there are immutable first principles that we need to get back to. People don't read enough textbooks. They read too much fucking research and they just sway and their experience is, 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 it holds no value because there's nothing that they're tested. There's nothing at the core of it. Right. There's the trade winds of research. And then we, look, we can talk about, you know, there's no bad people. There's just bad incentives. And, you know, that is true, I think, in the research sure. world. But I think for too long, we used research to prove things wrong rather than looking at principles to figure out why things were right. Mm. And I think that's the big that's the big shift that we're seeing now in people who are innovating in the space is they're, they're taking a look at people who are espousing research, the research that's available to us. And, you know, then you have to sift through what of that is of high enough quality to be applicable. Yeah. And then, you know, those people are, are, are being outperformed. Right? And that's why high net worth individuals and athletes are a really nice proving ground because, you know, the proof they is have in the, the money and the, and the proof is in the scoreboard. Yep. Right. It brings objectivity back into the world. So, the, yep. yes, they're buying the big screen TVs, but they're the ones showing the results. So I think like, you, you know, I think research is great. 
But I always think, you know, I came up under the sort of the, the influence of Charles Poliquin, like maybe yeah. rest in peace. Oh, yeah. And he, he was doing cluster training 25 years before they proved the efficacy of That's it. That's right. If he were to wait, he never would have done that, right? No. But he understands the principles of muscular physiology. He understands, you know, nervous system adaptation. So in a, from a principles perspective, it could work. Right? And I think principles are the core of what informs better research to be done in the first place. I think we've put research too much up on a pedestal in an evidence-based model. And you know, looking at a clinician's understanding of principles, the client and patient values is, is another arm of, of evidence that I don't think people look at. And we're conflating evidence-based with research-based. A lot of people are like, oh, I'm evidence-based. Mm -mm. And it's like, you know, you talk about the parachute thing. Like I've been in conferences where people will push me on this. It's like, are there squirrels in this room right now? No. Do squirrels exist? Yes. Right? So you might not see the results in the confined, or confined uh, sanitized space of a study with, an, you know, like nothing makes me laugh like an eight-week hypertrophy study. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh like some God, asshole has been, I've been doing this for eight like biggest You're pet done, peeve for us. Right. But if you can if you can understand the principles of amino acids, you can understand the mTOR process, you can yeah. probably make some really informed decision that over the course of someone's life right. will guide them. And the that's right the problem with the whole anti-aging industry Jesus, and all these <laughs> all these uh kind of geek doctors who aren't actually in the real world doing the application because they don't understand the fundamental principles. So in physics they call it first principles. And now in biology, we understand the fundamental principles principles or hallmarks of aging. There's 10 hallmarks. There's like chronic inflammation, mitochondrial dysfunction, loss of proteostasis. There's all these lists. And then right. basically, but those 10 fundamental principles govern almost every chronic disease. So if you can understand how those fundamental principles happen and how to alter those, and you can treat so many different diseases. At the very least, you have a very, very good direction. And you have a framework to work with. Right. And that's why these these anti-aging, the, the problem with the community is they're just, they're doing exactly what he said. They're these just are like, like the guys that go on, on, t on TikTok and they're like, don't stimulate M2 exactly, or exactly. make exactly. get cancer. And that's, what, and that's boomers, why, it, you know, it's boomers. Yeah, <laughs> man. Frig. <laughs> I don't want to, I guess I don't want to no, drop no, no, names no, in the man. front, but, uh, you know, but like, even like the Harvard scientist guy, David Sinclair, like he talks about intermittent, like he talks about all that stuff, right? Yeah. But then he's like, you're talking about mTOR, but then it's like, but yes, working out and protein stimulates mTOR, but you need protein because it's anti-catabolic yeah, and it'll yeah, protect yeah. you from muscle no. loss yeah. and sarcopenia. What's more important? What's the principle of yeah. aging? The number one principle of aging is muscle and keeping that, preserving that muscle. That's why the statin is such a big deal because it inhibits statin and it's anti-catabolic, right? But the, the, and so these guys are getting their order mixed up, their order of like sequence, right? And then they're putting other things in front of the most, more important yeah. thing. I'm going to back you up. The baby the bath water I'm going to back you up. So you, um, we, we, there was just, there was some studies that Dr. Gabriel Lyon brought up on testosterone replacement therapy and prostate cancer. Now we thought prostate cancer driven by androgens, cut out testosterone, that'll Im improve survivability. Now the data showing no, actually better outcomes by maintaining normal testosterone levels. That would be a principle. Low exactly. testosterone, unhealthy. Normal exactly. testosterone, healthy. And I said that, I've, I've been saying that 10, since all the stuff even Peter talks about, like I've been saying that stuff for like 10 years because it's because it's from the fitness industry. It's like easy to understand that if you have more testosterone, you have more energy, you have more better mood, you have better metabolic function processes, and you're going to exercise more. If you're going to exercise more, then your health is going to improve. Your metabolic health improves, your cardiovascular reduction goes down. But a re just, yeah, research is only, it's a, it's a, the problem is research is only meant to look at the outcome of one variable. That's yeah. right. 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 And we're so multivaried in our systems, like longevity is, you know, it's what boom, do boomers are losing. It's funny to see <laughs> yeah, the shift actually, like, seriously. cause you guys, when I first you know met you guys and Craig was still here with his yeah. fucking long hair and, yeah. you know, you were too wild and out for him. Like your, your, your enemy at the gate was, you know, the, the overhyped shreds, bad information. Right. And it's like, we've turned the industry like over to the adults all of a sudden. Like it's been a weird shift. Like yeah. the focus of you guys, you guys are now, you know, you stayed sort of centered in your principles and have been able to look at the industry, kind of do this pendulum swing. It's like, why are we listening to all these old people? You want to talk about longevity with old people, make sure grandma doesn't fall over. Yeah. That's a low hanger, right? hundred percent. Dude, you, yeah. you, That's a number you one fall and break your hip. And where does that That's come Well, why? Because their muscles are not, not only not being used from, you know, like a motor output standpoint, like getting up out of a chair unassisted is one of the leading predictors of all cause mortality. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if we start to look at muscle from a sensory, from a principal perspective, it's like, hey, we can build, like we can go through a process of like neural polishing or neural sharpening with a muscle spindle. And we can actually change how a muscle contracts, not from like an, uh, an efferent, then afferent in, so motor out sensory in, 
we can actually have a sensory, uh, we can initiate a muscle contraction with a sensory input, which is what stability is. It's, you know, it's a, it's, it's a gamma motor neuron loop between a muscle spindle and its respect, respective okay. uh, cord level, right? So if I have someone who I'm training who is elderly and I get them to stand on one leg and they're always, it's like they don't know, their, their hip hasn't been trained. I can put a band on her knee and strengthen the motor output. Right. But, but that's for not the her, same. I need the sensory input, right? And that's where like, you know, we can sit and talk about these funny supplements that are, you know, you know, that increase all of these things in your blood lab. Or I can look at someone and be like, she can't stand yeah, on one leg. On one leg. <laughs> she, she has four stairs to get into her apartment, right? I'm gonna have to stop buying grandma Christmas gifts in a few years. Cause if she eats shit, She's, you know, the statistic I think on a broken hip and broken ribs are similar over the age of 65, that 50% of people are going to die within a year. Yep. And we're having conversations about supplements in the Amazon. What exactly. are we doing? <laughs> well, right? that, and exactly. You come back to the principles, yeah. right? And that's why, I mean, I, I, I mean, not to promote the false statin, but it does increase bone density. And that's yeah. what our trial showed as well. It increases lean body mass, it has body recomposition effects. So it helps you to lose fat, increase lean body mass, and increases bone density. That's why we're doing our phase two trial in Japan because they have the ages, the oldest aging population for mm -hmm. doing it for sarcopenia and osteopenia. And uh, so that's the reason, it, but the, the vision with the technology is that we wanted to have access to every basically old person on the planet because it, there's no harm and there's so much benefit for okay. it. All right, I'm going to ask you a question at the risk of uh, pissing off Jordan, but uh, we're going to take a quick, just a little detour to supplements. Is creatine the ultimate longevity supplement that's available over the counter uh, largely, would you say? In my opinion, uh, whey protein and Creapure and maybe HMB are the top three. Yeah. The top three. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I would say so, yes. Okay. And again, where did they come from? The body world, bodybuilding world, right? That's where that's where we come from. HMB, for people who don't know, it's, it's a, a metabolite of leucine, right? Exactly, okay. yeah. Anti-catabolic, three grams a day, hugely protective. They put that in uh, some nursing homes now. Put exactly. That in their, yeah. It should be for every ICU patient, they should get that too. But like again, like the hospital systems yeah. don't, don't, don't look at this stuff, but because yeah. it's so important. There's been studies done on that and how ICU patients, one week in the ICU bed, you lose like, it's ridiculous amount of muscle. I can't remember the exact yeah. percentage, but it's a lot. And the, the, to gain it back takes a lot of time. So yeah. if you can do anything that's anti-catabolic, it's going to be hugely impactful on their clinical Now, for outcomes. someone eating a ton of protein, already eating a gram of protein per pound of body weight, you don't, HMB, whey protein, waste of time, right? Creatine's still good though. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, Crea Pure is, you can't go wrong with that. And uh, I mean, I think there's a lot of talk about taurine, but again, these, they made headlines, taurine, but like, it, it, just like, it was like an animal mouse study. And then they're like, everyone's yeah. talking about taurine as the best anti-aging supplement. No. And like, that's the problem with this community. They're just trying to like anything, like any research headline, they're just promoting the shit out of it when the foundation is the foundation. It's not gonna change, but yeah. it's not sexy and you can't keep making headlines off that. I, I love what you, Jordan said about the principles, sticking to the principles. I wanna go back to, to what you said about what you hate, because we went over it real quick. And to me, it's- <laughs> We love the, it when you hate a lot something. Of things. Well, <laughs> This is this is for sure the one of my biggest pet peeves. The thing that we probably have to talk about more than anything else because it is always some TikTok fucking trainer that's posting some new hypertrophy eight week study about how this is the best thing for this. This it's is like, the rep range. This is the and tempo. so we're yeah. always having to because it doesn't align with maybe something that we present. It's like you guys are fucking stupid if you think that <laughs> this is how it works. Like take that study out for a year and yeah. then tell me how well it's working for you, and then I can show you something else that's completely opposite of that, and it'll work just as well. Exactly. So, explain that for us, for our audience, because it is something that we're Why always- Why those eight-week hypertrophy studies are dumb. Yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, just the one thing is looking at exercise for hypertrophy in itself is dumb. <laughs> well, like, you know, I think at a certain point, you need to understand the nutritional subcomponents that drive muscle hypertrophy, right? And like the thing that we're actually looking for is a building of tissue. It's like, you're going to need available resources. So the very premise of like an exercise, like I think there's some, the immutable principles of muscle hypertrophy are probably going to be length and load. Yeah. Right now, length and load. Then we can dive a little bit more into like resistance profiles and strength curves. But I think understanding like performance this is just such like a loosely understood term. Like, you know, a friend of mine, a co and coach with us at, at Prescript, one of our educators, Killian Hamilton, has this idea of a runway of progression, right? Like how long is a runway of a progression of an exercise? Because right? there are exercises where like, you know, if I have a, a bilateral bent over dumbbell row, right? That, that will top out at a certain point. Or comparing a squat to a bicep curl. Right. Yeah. Be a very, there's completely different, the whole adaptation process, the learning curve, everything, which, so if you take an eight week study on those two things, like you can't, right. you can't compare them. And, and it's just, the idea is we need progressive. And I think one of the, 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 the nomenclature slights of hand that have sent people awry over the years is the idea of progressive overload. Now, mm -hmm. like, I don't want to like, you know, piss anyone off, but the idea is we need progressive overstimulus. 
And I think there's a difference between progressive progressive overstimulus. I'm going to steal that. Okay, great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, go yeah, ahead. Yeah. Make sure you do it with the walking thing too. Yeah. Like, <laughs> a man, is am I at this camera? A <laughs> man who loves right. walking, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I'll sell yeah. it, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the idea of progressive overstimulus, it trumps the idea of progressive overload because it also in, in, incorporates progressive overload. That's right. Right. So progressive overstimulus is my preferred umbrella like term for what we I need. Like that. Now, there are exercises that become impossible to, not impossible, but uh, become inefficient to continually overstimulate, right? So that's why bodybuilders classically, and they, they've, I mean, they might not have landed on this principle, but they are embodiments of this principle. Like if you ever trained with a bodybuilder, I'm sure you all have, yeah. you know, you obviously mm -hmm. in your career have probably done some really dumb shit, <laughs> right? Like how many times have you just like, you know, run the rack on a dumbbell lateral raise. Yeah. Excuse me, pardon me. You're just flapping your wings all the way down into the women's section to yeah. have pink dumbbells in your hands. And it's like, well, you know, it becomes difficult with bodybuilders. And the reason they're always coming up with more creative stuff is like, you know, imagine you went out and did a recreational drug and your first drug was heroin. It's like, well, where do you go from there? Yeah. Right mm -hmm. now it's, so that's kind of the thing when you're dealing with clientele is like, you need to understand their baseline recoverability at the stimulus level that they can tolerate now. That's right. Right. And then some people like, you know, I had trained with a, a bodybuilder in Dubai when I was living there and every single exercise on legs was a top set 12 to failure. The next set was a, a rest pause set at the same weight. The next set was a uh, single drop set and the next set was a double drop set. Did you do For this workout Lord. too? Dude, it's nuts. Yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah. I did. Uh, it was Jamie. His name is Jamie DeRigo. Did you Hi, throw Jamie. up? <laughs> oh, dude, you're just like, well, because it's hard when you know this stuff and the you're like- The first set would have made me die. <laughs> dude, I'm cr like you're crushed and it's, it's to the point now- if you understand the physiology sure. and you understand like, you know, in that world, the enhanced physiology, and you can look at this and don't look at it from a research thing. Look at it from a principles base. Like what is this guy's free testosterone levels? What is this guy's lifestyle? Like dorigo has got two dogs back in his villa and he's going to take his raw or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And he's going to like wake up. He's going to graze to the fridge. He's going to graze his big ass back to the couch do a couple client check-ins and then he's going to go to bed. Right. So it's like, it's so easy to look at like, well, you know, this level of training volume, it's like, yeah, but we look, everyone tries to play his own where in this world, you got to play the man, right? Like you got to take a look at the person. And like, you know, that's why I think biomechanics is, is a vehicle of or exercise as a selection as a vehicle of biomechanics is so important because the idea of an underwriting stimulus of an exercise is like what people need to understand yeah. the most, right? Like, does your body know the difference between a squat and a leg press? It depends on how good you are at each of those two things totally. right if you're if you can manage at high volumes that demand of muscular co-contraction then sure maybe the squat's going to have some ancillary benefits if you can't and that can be a transient i've had clients who come in like you know when i worked down the road at stanford one of my clients was a cardiothoracic surgeon they work kind of like firemen so this dude, Paul, hi, Paul. He, he's not listening to this. <laughs> uh, maybe he is. Fuck God. The people that are listening to this show, Jesus. He would spend like four days in Napa with his dog. And then he would come back and be on call at the ICU, cardiothoracic trauma surgery for like two days straight. Right. So I'd see him after like 17 hour surgery, right? He's scrubbed in, shitting in diapers, replacing lungs, replacing spleens, all this stuff. And then he would come into the gym. Well, post Napa, Paul can do a squat to, with with technical proficiency to something that is probably in a proximity of you know muscular failure at a local level at the adductors quads or glutes, right? But you get Paul after a seventeen hour surgery. No, it's you're like, gonna leg extensions. We're in a leg extension, maybe some leg press, right? But the stimulus is the same, so we're still able in a program to progressively overstimulate those muscles. You can still make tons of progress. Yeah, context mm -hmm. context matters. Well, auto regulation, matters. and a lot of people don't know how to auto regulate. But right? here's what I want: I want the death of I want the death of the saying in the personal in the personal training industry. We are just gonna go light today needs to die, <laughs> right? And because we're always gonna go heavy, but we're gonna constrain the loadability by the exercise selection, yeah, yeah. and that's the fundamental principle. It's appropriate of intensity yeah. is what yeah. it is. Yeah. yeah. And it, we modulate not by changing load, but by changing the loadability of the movement, changing the exercise. Got it. And mm -hmm. if we understand mm -hmm. the fundamental stimulus that we're driving, we can always progressively overstimulate. Mm. You're like a philosopher that's sometimes. Brilliant. I do what I can. Yeah. Yeah. I spent a lot of time, you know what? I spent a lot of time on myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know that we always have to do a follow-up episode to like translate everything. That we oh, yeah. Episode, so yeah. Sick. Yeah. yeah, your podcast is always two podcasts. Oh, we fun. do the podcast yeah. with you and then we do another episode with the translate later. The breakdown. Yeah. Yeah. The subtitles. Yeah. So I'm going to go apply yeah. it. Work out appropriately. Yeah. Uh, your your certification is is done phenomenal things. People comment on it. They talk about how amazing it is. I can see why. I mean, you really put everything you have into it and you just constantly learn and grow. And this is pretty amazing stuff. You must be attracting people from all walks of fitness and even medicine 
uh, to your certifications? Are you getting people like physical therapists and oh yeah, I mean occupational it, therapists? It's and, funny the cross section. Uh, power it, lifters, I'm sure. The cross section is just the intersections of the stuff I'm passionate about. So like we get you know trainers and coaches, obviously, and, and I hope that will always remain because that means mm -hmm. I'm keeping a finger on the pulse of, and I'm actually staying active in training people face to face, mm -hmm. right? Like I don't think there's a week that goes by that I'm not training with someone. Yeah. Also, the people that are probably impacting the most people, right? Yeah, and that's what we're after, man. Like yeah. we're after like the meta impact, and and I kind of tell that to all of our students out of the jump is like, look, you know, I, I care about the thirty of your clients, or the forty, or the fifty, or the hundred, or the thousands of clients you'll have over your career. Like you're a vehicle. Like you're a vehicle of this information. Like yeah. you, you want to talk meta impact, like how many downloads you guys get a month, yeah, right? Sure. There's a, so there's a responsibility and there's an accountability that comes with that. So PTs and coaches are, are I think, you know, a, a, a direct representation of how much that I do. And it's funny to see the shift. Like, you know, in the last four months, I was on the road primarily in a strength coach position. And then I, you start to see our intakes draw in more strength coaches, yeah. right? Or if I'm doing things in a more clinical designation, like, you know, during the NFL season, I'll, I'll probably travel more and do more clinical work and we start to pull in more clinicians. So we'll have everything from physical therapists, chiropractors, uh, you, you know, uh, osteopaths, any manual medicine subdiscipline, physical ther uh, sorry, personal trainers. And now we're starting to, you know, it will, as we look to bridge the gap and, you know, having relationships with uh, a deal has helped this, we're starting to get more of the conventional medical community. Like we're starting to get a lot of medical doctors starting to look That's into awesome. this. Yeah. yeah, it's nice because you know what? I, I think ultimately the common trait that the people that come into our community have is that they want to help people. That's right. Right. And, and you know, that's a lot of people use that trope in like a self-proclaimed virtuous way. But, it, you know, when you start to actually deal with the systems that are built around these things to safeguard people, you start to realize, look, some of these systems are actually limiting my ability to help people, right? So- This is why I love personal trainers so yeah. much. I don't know anybody who became a trainer because I want to be rich. In fact, right. it's a terrible way to become rich. Yeah. But they all really genuinely want to help people. Yeah. You know, you're, you're arming uh, people with the tools and the knowledge. What we try to do is to build the- the philosophy or the Tao, like this is the how, and this is how you approach things. And here are the ways that you, you help people and work with them, but they need the tools. And so we're very, very um, fortunate to have people like you put, you know, stuff out like that. It's not a lot, not a lot out there. That's do you have a favorite that, that you teach? Do you have a favorite like group of people? Like, do you like the clinicians better? Do you like, like, who do you like to teach the most? God, it's tough, man. Like, I, I think I really like teaching the athletes. Okay. Cause like, you know, we, we run a combine program every year that puts, you know, 30 of the top 300, uh, NCAA. It's gotta be because the adherence. Is that uh, why? Yeah. It's the adherence, but it's, it's, it's the idea of like, look, you know, it's the meta impact at a level where, you know, if a, the specificity matters, right. Mm -hmm. Cause you know, you teach a lot of these young kids what to look out for in their career. Yeah. And that's like a big thing. It's like, if someone ever tells you this, man, like I give all these kids my number. So I've been doing comp, fuck, I've been doing combine prep for almost a decade and really intensely for the last three or four years. And so I'll get, you know, I've seen guys all the way through their career, unfortunately, in some cases with the NFL having the, it, the issues in managing load and, and the risk and, and that's associated with playing. But I'll get guys who will, I will put through a combine two, three, four years ago, hit me up and it's like, hey man, I got you know, sca scaffoldunate dislocation. Like they want to do this. Like, no, no, no. Like f fuck non-surgical is the move here. Go talk to this person. Right. She's the best hand therapist in, in the United States. Go talk to her. Right. So it's, those are people that I like just because the outcomes are like the impact is so big. Right. Like yeah, cause people watch them, listen to them. They have huge influence also. Yeah. Well, and it's, you know what, they didn't get there. They, they didn't get there by like knowing the human body. They knew the game. Right. So I think it's been really unique to and, and from a communication standpoint, it's also something that's grounded me because, you know, I get that a lot. Yeah, we have to do another podcast to translate all the shit that Jordan said. <laughs> <laughs> but working with athletes and keeping my finger on the pulse, especially kids coming out of a four-year college division one program who just want a ball, right? They're going to get the bag. What was Zay Flowers signing bonus? Like oh, $7 God, million. Yeah. Dollars? Like, yeah, fuck it, dude. Make your bread, dude. Like 100%. I'm like, I'll be your biggest fan but they've helped me refine my delivery down to a level. And I teach coaches this. I teach like, so I'm going to tell like a little bit of a story. I grew up in Windsor, Ontario and three minutes from where my parents live, uh, there was a gun seizure. It's like kind of a rough part of Canada. It's like right opposite Detroit. And I loved it. It was the most poetic collection of guns I've ever seen. And it really stuck with me. There was a 22, 
a Benelli 12 gauge pump action shotgun and an M72 single shot rocket launcher. Okay. Right. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, yeah. Wins it represent 509 <laughs> on the map. That's yeah. The what whole, up? What up? I want XY axis. But there. it's <laughs> odd. But it's so beautiful because like if you know guns, you're like, oh, 22, someone breaks into your crib. They're going to, yeah, you shoot the guy, right? The Bill Burr yeah. joke. You just want to shoot the yeah. guy. The 12 gauge, it's like, you're going to have to read your eyewall after. And the M72 is like, yo, my neighbor's dog will shut the fuck up. Right? <laughs> right. So, but I, I work, I, I work on when I contextualize, you know, principles that I learn, especially when and I talk to him and I'm translating some of the, like the really, really technical stuff. It's like, I need, and I've heard Neil deGrasse Tyson talk about this too. It's like understanding how to communicate in sound bites relative to your audience. Right. So like the working with players has allowed me to create my 22, right? Like I have, you know, I can sit in circles with, with him and his colleagues with the M72 single shot. And I just sit there like this, like, yeah. oh, ask me a question, ask me a question. Ask me a question. <laughs> I'm going to go nuclear. On this, right. And it's like, you know, it's useful to have that and still trust your colleagues that are, uh, in different disciplines. And, you know, when you deal with athletes, it really, get, you know, we kind of get siloed in our own worlds, talking to other fitness professionals, but going there to like communications degree, four year, you know, Syracuse or Florida State yeah. or Alabama or Auburn, Georgia, whatever. Oh, I need to, I need to actually refine my accuracy with my 22, right? I've been sitting here thinking I'm some sort of academic marksman with an M72 and I'm just blowing shit up. I'm blowing, like blowing people's hair back. So that's been for me, like the most useful is actually teaching an individual athlete who's like, they have such a peripheral really need to understand it. Yep. So what gets the message through is one, like the passion, like I'm in this shit, I'm in their face, I'm on the ground, I got their hands on their foot, I'm pull, taking my shoe off. I'm like, yeah. I'm like sweating after every session. So that kind of gets them in the door. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, how do I communicate to this guy who, you know, once he signs his contract, once, you know, he gets his name called, he's going to make seven, $8 million. And he's got there, not everybody knowing this. So then how do I communicate in a way that makes sense right. and long-term will stick with him? So I think that's been for me the most beneficial because I was so focused on the M72 for so long, yeah. right? I was in school, you know, I'm coming into the industry, social media. I don't look like I look like I work at the docks. So like I want, I should probably try and sound really smart because I look like I deal drugs for a living. So, but now it's like kind of bringing it full circle. And it's like, okay, how do that's I awesome. actually bring it to the masses? So yeah, that's been my, kind of my favorite. I always what? forget how young you are too. Yeah. I know. <laughs> City miles dog. Yeah, you yeah, forget because yeah, yeah. I look terrible. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Cause like, cause you, cause you sound, you're, you're, I mean, you're obviously. Jordan, what, what you said that made me uh, pose a question. So what sport presents uh, the most challenges with load management? Um, oh, that's a really good question. Honestly, like I probably wouldn't have said this up until this year, but professional tennis is getting up there. Interesting. Right. Cause if you look at the planes of motion, if you look at the oh, repeated sprint ability, yeah. if you look how much time, and if you look at the schedule, there's no tennis season, right? Mm -hmm. Technically now we're coming off the U S open and there won't yeah. be another slam until January, but you need to earn your, you, you kill what you eat in that game. Yeah. Right. Tennis players are fucking dogs, man. Like they are You're some right. of the hardest yeah. working athletes. They're the most health, the health forward and they have no help. Right. The ATP is probably one of the most unprofessional professional sporting organizations there is. Right. There's not like there's a commissioner. Right. They, you know, and we get into the money side of the ATP and some of the issues that they're having. And they're, they're actually the first they did, hadn't didn't have a players association until very recently. Right. So uh, looking at tennis, having a close proximity to that football has to be up there. You know, depending on the position, just because of the physicality. Right, because right? you're the also, contact. the other variables, people are hitting you at the same yeah, time. Yeah, like, too. there's nothing that creates muscle, and we know this from a principal standpoint, there's nothing that creates muscle damage like high-velocity eccentrics. What do you think getting hit by Vita Vea is? Yeah. yeah. Oh, dude, homeboy, I'm telling you, in the first 10 yards, Vita Vea on a line with Deontay Johnson and Debo Samuel is nose to nose. You know, you do the physics on I, well, I know, if, if you've ever <laughs> watched action, that, yeah, if you've ever watched that sports science show where they crashes. actually break it down, it's like the equivalent to like seven car crashes yeah. or some crazy shit like Every that. Every single Sunday, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the ability to manage load and just understand like at a, even at a basic level, at a muscular level, uh, what's happening and the tissue repair demands that are there. I would say soon after that would probably be mixed martial arts. Oh. UFC, because there's- There's just so many variables. Well, you yeah. can't understate the role of sympathetic drive of and course. shadowing pain. Have you ever been in a car accident? You don't really feel it until three or four days oh, yeah. later, right? So they're yeah. tough to manage around fights because the adrenaline is so high. The sympathetic drive is so high. So I put those two top two. Uh, awesome. Interesting. Well, awesome. I never guessed tennis. That's cool. Yeah. 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 Always fun. Dude, yeah, always yeah, fun. Keep going. Absolute yeah. blast having you on, man. Both yeah. you guys. Great meeting you. Yeah, yeah, no, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. Hopefully I gave 
everyone something like the perspective on like yeah. selling gene therapy you know it's exciting yeah. he just did this Very so research, yeah. that he won't get killed <laughs> so that, <laughs> he's like enough people will know me that they can't kill me yeah. now. we're gonna talk yeah. afterwards yeah yeah, yeah yeah i'm i guarantee we'll stay in touch for sure so for sure cool. thanks yeah. for coming yeah. on thank John. you both you guys yeah no, thanks for having us yeah